Hello, hi everyone. My name is Rafał Motriuk. I'm a science and technology journalist and I'll be your host today. Thank you very much for having me. Our event is called Code Dive. So we are back for Nokia's, well, another Nokia's Code Dive conference this year. And I know so many of us enjoyed those previous years, but you might enjoy this year's even more because, well, let's face it, it's the most technologically advanced. So the way we're doing it this year is we're doing it as live, which means we make it appear as if it was live, but in fact, we have recorded everything in advance. By the way, we're broadcasting from Wrocław, a Nokia hub here in Poland. And with that, I'd like to give floor to Taras Lukaniuk, who's head of Nokia's Wrocław Technology Center. Taras, over to you. Thank you, Rafa. Seven editions, 250 plus speakers, 40,000 participants, and first time online. The unfortunate reason we cannot meet in our usual cinema rooms is obviously COVID. That's the reason we are doing it exclusively online this year. When the pandemic has started, we asked ourselves, will we manage? And this number proves to me that at the bottom of our heart, we all are code divers. We do explore opportunities when others see a problem. We all enjoy learning. When the problem is solved, we feel satisfied for the next couple of minutes. And what do we do next? Next, we are looking for another challenge to, to pick up. So what is Code Dive? Code Dive is more than just a conference. It is a tradition. Like the fact that festive season comes every December, it is a fact we all meet at a Code Dive every November. Many of you are with us since the first edition, starting from 2014. But we also do have many new participants. For the first timers, Code Dive is an event where IT professionals meet, discuss the latest trend, share their ideas, and share their experience. We also would like to have a platform for networking. I am a fan of simplicity, as you can see. And I would like to make it very simple using the comparison operator. Nokia Wrocław equals Code Dive. Code Dive equals Nokia Wrocław. And from here, Nokia Wrocław site, I would like to thank you all, participants, speakers, media, and organizers, for making this happen. So relax in your chairs, put your headset on, and enjoy the learning with us. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you, Taras. Thank you so much for this warm welcome. So this year we've got two streams, A and B. So take your pick, choose the one you like, and well, let's get started.
Our first speaker is Maciej Norberczak. Now, Maciej works at Nokia as a software architect, but also trainer and mentor. He has got his PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence, but has worked in telecommunications ever since. He's taken part in projects on various embedded platforms as a programmer, designer, architect, and project manager. Now, interestingly, Three of Maciej's in-laws are all in IT, but his wife, who used to be a railroad engineer, well, she has seen the light and converted to telecommunications. Anyway, Embedded Systems 101, Maciej, over to you. Thank you. Hello. First, I have to explain myself and explain the title a little bit. Last year, I was a host at this very conference. And in my room, I expected to be bored because the titles of the speeches were, were basic, I would say. As a <coughs> graduate of software engineering, I thought that those things uh, you should already know as a decent student or graduate uh, of computer science, electronics or whatnot. But I was wrong. I was surprised because the room was packed and I was not bored. And then this revelation came to me that, well, not everyone has the same education. And although I graduated primarily as a software engineer, uh, majored in artificial intelligence and parallel processing, I've never got any decent course or even introduction on embedded systems. Hence, embedded systems and hence 101 in American course numbering systems. Uh, this number is often used to uh, mark a beginner level course on the subject. <coughs> this is your concrete one hour peel of knowledge I hope you enjoy. First, what's an embedded system on or ES? Actually, no one knows for sure and your mileage might vary if I have to explain what I work on to my non-technical grandmother, I start with something like, uh, you know, grandma, I work in computers, but computers that are not really computers, but do computerish stuff like microwaves and uh, dryers, and I did the sous vide controller by myself, and I have a smartwatch and computer keyboard, which is also got that system actually Everything, from my point of view, or, or almost everything, is an embedded system. But as I said, your mileage might vary. <coughs> For a guy working in a cloud or on a cloud, a phone is already an embedded system. On the other hand, if you work on programming microcontrollers, everything that has an operating system is not an embedded system. It's too, too complicated. I will just show you two definitions from the books and I will try to convince you that they show a pattern. First one, very good book, Making Embedded Systems. An embedded system is a computerized system that is purpose-built for the application. And the system and purpose-built are the keywords here. Here is a proper dictionary of embedded systems, a combination of computer hardware and software, and perhaps some other parts designed to perform a dedicated function. In some cases, embedded systems are part of larger uh, system or products, like a car. A car by itself is not an embedded system, but uh, has parts like anti-braking, uh, anti-lock braking system, which are embedded systems. Embedded systems have usually narrower field of application than your garden variety universal PC computer. Naturally, if you take a smartphone, you will say that, okay, th it's not one dedicated function, phoning, but a variety, a plethora of different primary functions. Yes, but still, we call it a phone. We have also devices like smart TVs, where apart from this primary TV function, we have a number of general functions unrelated to this mi main function. But the key is, this is a system, this is a combination of hardware and software, often part of a larger system, and it's designed, purpose-built to perform a dedicated function. 
I don't want to get into this definition fight. For me, as I said, almost everything is embedded. Just remember this dedicated function and purpose build. The name of the game in embedded systems is always constraint, inconveniences, constraints, limitations, and problems. Actually, I work in a corporation, so we don't use this word problems much. We rather call them challenges. And I will talk about those inconveniences, constraints, limitations, and challenges for the next hour or so. First challenge is, was, and always will be reliability. Embedded system usually has higher reliability and quality requirements than, again, your garden variety PC. You don't see this thing often in embedded systems. This is a blue screen of death in Windows. Of course, some families of embedded systems uh, like TVs, cell phones, um, games, and so on, when they malfunction, mm, well, it's an inconvenience, but nothing bad really happens. It's not a life-threatening situation. But there are systems like car engine control system, I'm talking to you, Toyota, when they crash on a busy highway, you are in trouble. In worst case scenario, you're dead. The same thing when critical medical device malfunction during surgery. Another name for reliab reliability is predictability. And predictability leads us to determinism. Here you see the screenshot from a computer game. It's uh, Sir Fred, it's 1986, ZX Spectrum computer. This uh, was a platform game, and the position of objects in game world is determined by random number uh, generation. And the pseudo-random number generator in Spectrum had this peculiar property. After power cycle, it always returns zero as the first value. So the position of objects in game world after power up was always the same. This was a hard game and this fact made it a little bit easier. In some computer systems, in some embedded systems, software must operate in fully deterministic way. But if you studied computer science, uh, you can co uh, call BS on me because, hey, every computer, almost every computer is a deterministic Turing machine. Deterministic. You, we know what happens. Yes and no. If it was fully deterministic, we would never see those things. Why do we see them? Well, we are just human beings. We do make mistakes and errors, and we cannot predict everything that happens in a very complicated system. The stimuli, the events that happen in random time intervals may lead to unpredicted situations and hence blue screens. But there are some embedded systems that cannot afford those. So they have to be fully deterministic and naturally we still may get errors because of cosmic radiation, I kid you not, or simple hardware failure. But we have methods that ensure that our systems are more predictable than your garden variety PCs. Still you have errors and we have to challenge we have to cope with this challenge of error handling. There are systems that you cannot repair. Like those. Uh, this is a Jaguar and he or she well actually this is definitely a he he has this peculiar collar. This is a GPS tracker and it's battery operated. Apart from primary sh uh, function, so tracking the animal movements, it tracks ambient temperature, animal temperature, its heartbeat, and so on. Mm. Naturally, you could replace the battery or repair the device when it malfunctions, but it's not feasible, really, because you have to know track the animal, hunt it, uh, put it to sleep, replace the collar inconvenient. You don't do it in general. But you want this GPS tracker to function for as long as, as humanly possible. And when the battery goes down, 
you want this system to degrade gracefully. So the last thing that fails is your primary function, your GPS tracking. The same goes with satellites or things we put on Mars, those rovers. Even when the hardware fails completely and you have very little power left, the communication is the last thing that fails. On the other hand, we have systems that should stop functioning at the first sign of trouble. This is a pacemaker. This device shocks your heart in precisely calculated intervals in order to keep you alive, to keep your heart beating. When this device malfunction, malfunctions, uh, it starts to shock your heart in random intervals and it may kill you. So it should stop functioning when you detect the first error. When what happens when the shock from your pacemaker comes too late? It shouldn't be late. And with that, we move to the last big challenge of a Mavet system is real time. What real time means? It doesn't mean that things happen in real time immediately or very fast. It means in this context that the system reacts on event or stimuli in a precisely defined time. Look at this. This is an automated railroad crossing and when the train is coming three kilometers uh, before the crossing, the sensor detects this, this train passing and closes the gates. It doesn't have to be immediately. It doesn't have to be very fast. It can be slow but it has to happen before train passes the crossing. So we have this defined time. And if uh, you pass this deadline, bad things happen. We deal with these challenges all the time. And those challenges are connected with constraints. And the first source of constraints in embedded systems is hardware. And the main source of constraints coming from hardware is performance. You have a ce central processing unit, or a couple of them, on your board, and it has a definite performance. The more performant it is, the faster your program run runs. You can do more things in the same time. But the more performant your device is, the more power it uses. So it's all connected. The more power it uses, the more heat it produces, and you have to dissipate this heat. So performance, power, and heat are all interconnected. And then you have memory. Usually, well, maybe not usually, but quite often you can write a program in such a way that is very performant but occupies a lot of space in memory. On the other hand, you can make a program that is very tight on resources and uh, occupies just a fraction of memory, but it's kind of slow. So again, memory is connected with performance, and memory also produces heat. It's an electronic uh, device. Well, not as much as, uh, as a processor, but still heat. And then you have size. Well, obviously, if you produce a smartwatch, it has to be size of a smartwatch, not, not a freaking fridge or something. So that's one thing. But the other thing is the bigger, the more elements you have on board, the bigger the board is. The more elements you have on your board, the more layers you have in your boards, the more interconnections, it gets complicated. And the bigger your board is, the bigger radiator you can uh, mount of this board and uh, you can dissipate more heat. And this is not just the board, the package size matters like with smartwatches. It has to be small or can be big. Everything is connected with everything. And all those challenges are very important if you do a one-off thing like a wedding cake. Normally you just have one wedding or one wedding cake of those sorts, or when you build a space telescope like that, you just build one, not two, or millions. But if you build millions of things and you want to sell them in millions, 
all those constraints come to one, and this is a king of kings. This king's name is bill of materials. So the price you have to pay for your processor, for your heat dissipation, for your memory, for the level of complication on your board, for the power you use during operations, everything boils down to one. And this is most important challenge of them all. Believe me, I work in this industry for almost 20 years and I really hear bomb quite often, more often than I like. Okay, so that's just the hardware. Hardware is nothing without the software and we have constraints in the software. Okay, we have uh, already established that we have very little memory and a small processor, so we have less applications, we have smaller applications, we have smaller um, uh, number of abstraction layers in our software. We have reduced operating system functionality or no operating system at all. And we have poorer tooling to do this uh, old software and we need to use inferior languages. And let's start with those inferior languages. What uh, I mean when I say inferior, I mean C. When you do embedded, most often you have just C or C and C++, or actually C and C++ in some older version forget about C++ version 18 or 20 or whatever else is, is on the top right now. <coughs> Or you actually have C++, but without templates, without exceptions, and without multiple inheritance, so actually you have just C with objects. And I don't uh, try to pull your leg. This is the diagram i taken from embedded market study, which is done every year or so by Electronic Engineering Times. This is the data from last year. 75% of embedded systems are coded in C or C++. Java, Python, JavaScript or other mm, new languages or high-level languages are rare. They are used mostly on hobby platforms or things done in load volumes. Really, hard data, Python, peanuts, Java. <laughs> you see, every four, year, uh, four years I buy a PC and I have to install, set it up, and I install Java and I see this number. Three billion devices run Java. Do they like it? I'm not so sure. And this number hasn't changed in the last 10 years, by the way. JavaScript, yeah, this is just pathetic. So, if you want to get on the embedded game, you better get familiar with this gentleman. This is the creator of C language in 1970s in Bell Labs, now Nokia Bell Labs. Dennis McAllister Ritchie has created C language and Unix and many other things. When he passed the two weeks uh, from Steve Jobs, uh, his death hasn't got uh, much of a publicity, although his contribution to the world in general and to IT in particular which ma was much larger than Steve Jobs. Uh, all right, but let's go back to our challenges. You have to compile your program before it runs. And in order to do that in embedded world, uh, you need to use cross-compiler. Why it's cross-compiler? because it works outside your target device. Your target device is so poor in resources, then more often than not, cannot sustain this whole process of compilation. So you get the uh, compiler that works outside your target device and co compiles the code for the target device. And you get it most likely from the vendor of the target device. I mention it because, uh, well, if you are lucky and you work on a modern system, you most likely get a GNU compiler or something open source. But if you're not, you get this compiler from vendor and you have to pay extra or you have to pay extra for additional language. You uh, get just C and for C++ you have to pay. Mm. This cross compiler um, 
works either on your uh, desktop PC or, or uh, somewhere in the cloud. Uh, it's not really a challenge, it's rather an inconvenience. It's also an inconvenience because you have to transfer your code to your target device. You have your source on your PC, you have a cross compiler that compiles, builds, links, let's not get into details. Either way, you get object file in the end and you transfer it to your target device in some, uh, into some code space and you most likely will do it via a cable. Naturally, there are devices that have wireless capabilities and you sometimes can do it over the air, but uh, most likely you have this cable. This cable can get broken or misplaced, lost, something like that. Inconvenience. Another inconvenience is thinking about your operating system because uh, your program is nothing without the mm, environment that controls and runs it. Mm, what's an operating system anyway? Uh, it's a software. Yeah. It's a set of services that uh, allow you to control and execute tasks. Um, again, I don't want to get into this definition game with tasks, jobs, uh, processes, threads, tasks, programs, okay? Apart from this most important uh, thing uh, operating system does for you, um, resource management, memory management, processor time management, concurrency units management, etc. And it does hardware management for you. If you want to know more about operating systems, this is the one and only best book ever. Zilber, Schratz, Gavin and Go Yay. Uh, it's a night edition, it's like 50 quid on Amazon. Uh, you can buy a used one, previous editions. It's not like tectonic changes uh, in operating systems happen every, uh, every year. Fifth edition is good, you can... I got mine for two pence and the postage was four quid, so really, bargain. Okay, quickly, traditional operating systems. And by traditional, I mean that they do not guarantee uh, timely execution of tasks. Uh, why then do they don't gu guarantee it? Because uh, they have background processing, garbage collection, even scam and go in unexpected uh, moments. So sometimes mm, the system has mm, more important things to do than to run your embedded program. It's unfit for real-time operations. We need real-time operating system for that. And real-time computing guarantees that the answer from the system appears in this defined time, no later than so-called deadline. And we have various kinds of those deadlines. First, we have hard deadlines, so if you pass the hard deadline, your computation is not fast enough, your system stops working, or stops working properly, which is actually the same thing if your airbag explodes uh, in it does not explode in this precisely calculated moment of time, bam, you're dead. The same goes with uh, air traffic. And actually the same goes uh, with production lines, for example. Okay, nobody dies usually when production line misses the deadline, but you know, when you do pick and place and uh, your uh, production line has already moved, well, it's not working properly. But we have also less strict deadlines. We have something called firm deadlines. In firm deadline world, the uh, answer is useless after deadline passes, but it's tolerated on rare occasions. Naturally, the quality of, the, uh, of uh, service provided by the systems goes down, but as I said, it's tolerable. And apparently, things like uh, car uh, engine control systems uh, are, are the systems where we have firm deadlines. So if you fire, uh, if, if your mixture uh, is not calculated fast enough, if you misfire your engine, it's just a misfire. Uh, okay, either your house power goes down or your uh, fuel, uh, fuel consumption goes up, but it's it's not tragic. Apparently, also uh, pacemakers are in this category. Uh, because uh, 
pacemaker can be off by a small amount without killing the patient every now and then. Uh, but this definition is, you know, questionable and also the example of pacemaker is questionable. The difference here is in the eye of beholder, so it's between hot and warm. You, you will know it when you feel it. Last but not least, we have soft deadlines and you know them by heart. Uh, the answer uh, of the system is less useful after the soft deadline passes and the QoS goes down. When your frame rate goes down or your seismograph is missing a few data points or your sound system misses a bit or your system just freezes and is unresponsive for a couple of seconds, this is an example of soft deadline being. Those are multitasking systems designed for real-time operations, obviously, and usually they are in embedded systems. And usually the ability to predict the performance of the system and the programs running on the system is more important than optimization of this, this uh, performance. It's better to be sure that something happens in definite time than mm, not to be, simply. Uh, they are usually smaller than traditional OSs, but this is not the absolute rule. And you have to remember that they don't guarantee anything by themselves. They just give you proper tooling to do real-time processing, but you have to take care of writing your program in such a way that they don't miss your deadlines. Right now, uh, there are dozens active, I mean sold or being supported by community uh, RTOSs. Um, I think the most popular right now is uh, free RTOS. Mm, the name free suggests that it's open source, yes, but this is supported heavily but by contributions from Amazon. And from commercial ones we have uh, VxWorks, QNX uh, and TI RTOS, TI Texas Instruments. Okay, but what about those small systems where we don't have operating system at all? It's called bare metal or bare machine. And it's not uncommon, 30% of all embedded systems are machines without operating systems. So this software works without any support. It's useful when your system has to be very, very fast or is just simple or poor or in resources. The Flip side is that, sorry, you have to provide all those services that usually are provided by operating system but yourself, by yourself. But hey, the good thing is that sometimes you don't need any services. Uh, you just have firmware in hardware that uh, gives you low-level hardware control and uh, you have a simple set of interrupt service routines or a simple message loop and your program communicates via shared resources, nothing too complicated. How does it look? Uh, how does it look in reality? Uh, okay, uh, we have embedded, th this is actually uh, quite a poor diagram because they asked, uh, list all your uh, operating system currently in, in use and uh, Ubuntu, uh, Debian, Windows 10 are not really embedded systems, but Okay, let's ru run with it. Embedded Linux, naturally, it's quite popular, but we also have a big chunk of things that people write themselves. This is this in-house custom bar just under Embedded Linux. And then we have free RTOS, just as I said. Around 40% of embedded systems use operating uh, open source operating systems, I love those acronyms, without commercial support just because they don't need it. This is two-thirds of the answers. Commercial is too expensive, it's one-third, and 25% are wary of the vendor lock. If you buy something from one guy, you are with him till eternity. Naturally, community has its pros and cons. Uh, just remember that this free open source software it's not free because nothing is really free in this world. 
okay, we have a program, we compiled it, we have an operating system or not, we want to run it. It doesn't work. What to do? Well, obviously we have to debug, but remember your machine, your target machine does not have enough resources to support your compilation process, so most uh, likely it doesn't have resources to run the program and debugger at the same time. Challenge! The most effective debugging tool ever, also in embedded world, is carefully placed print statement. The author of this particular quote, Brian Wilson Keringham, uh, worked with uh, Richie and with Ken Thompson in Bell Labs and is actually the author of the Unix system. He's still alive, very much alive. Ken Thompson also is. Ken Thompson works in, in Google. He has created Go language, for example. All right, so how we do this, this debugging with print? Actually, it's called printf debugging because of the C function we use. Uh, it's used printf. Uh, some people call it uh, caveman debugging or many other mean, mean names, but the essence is the same. You have the program, you transfer it to your target device, and this target device produces some software out output with printf. And this output is transferred via serial uh, connection to your PC, which runs a serial terminal. Very simple, very effective. The problem is that sometimes you have a problem in your code, you start to debug it, I mean you put a bunch of printf statements in, and you trace the program, and suddenly, magically, the problem disappeared. Okay, so you, you magic happened. I don't see the problem, so you just remove those statements you added previously. And the bug reappears. Magic. Heisenbugs. Heisenbugs are bugs that disappear or alter their beh behavior when you try to debug them. And naturally, the term is pun on the name of Werner Karl Heisenberg, the gentleman. Uh, here, he was a physicist uh, who first uh, asserted the observer effect in quantum mechanics which states that the, art, uh, the act of observing the system inevitably alters its state. Um, this is a known phenomenon in electronics, it's called probe effect. When you connect the probe to your device, it changes its behavior. The problem with embedded is that it happens all the time. Okay, but uh, this, uh, this happens uh, with print statements, what uh, about other forms of debugging. It's 21st century, after all. Yes, we have other forms of debugging. And one of other forms uh, of debugging is in-circuit emulation, or simply ICE. In this situation, we have a cross-debugger program on our PC, and we have device called ICE, in-circuit emulator, that we connect to PC and to our target device, and this in-circuit emulator replaces our target processor. Mm. We operate by using a processor that has additional abilities. It's faster, more powerful to support the debugging process. Sorry, the hardware is aware of being debugged. It's not like in PC that you can run the debugger and the program at the same time and the program is not aware of being debugged. In in-circuit emulation, the hardware is aware of being debugged and this ICE emulator is usually a uh, bound out processor. So uh, s that means that some of the internal signals of this processor are bound out. You can access them and you can check the internal state of the processor. It also mm, supports modern things like breakpoints, watchpoints. You can even put a breakpoint in uh, re read-only memory. That means that your ICE processor 
has a special register which is compared to the uh, instruction counter every cycle and if we have a breakpoint here the execution stops. Usually you just have two of those so you can use two breakpoints sorry and again the hardware is aware of being debugged. Uh, and if hardware is aware of being debugged, that means that you have uh, inevitably changed some dependencies in your code. And that means that Heisenbachs may appear. Okay, but uh, it's quite inconvenient to do this in circuit emulators because, first of all, they are very, very expensive. The uh, providers, vendors of the of the chips do two versions of the of the chip, one for debug, one for production, and this deb debug version in ICE is very expensive most of the time. But again, we have twenty uh, first century, we have invented on chip debugging. At actually on chip debugging was uh, invented in the last century. It's called uh, JTAG uh, it's uh, a loose term actually, JTAG abbreviation comes from Joint Test Action Group in 1985 they have defined as uh, spe specified the debug port implementing a serial communication uh, for low overhead access without requiring direct access to uh, internal uh, system address and data buses. Uh, they also defined the set of register uh, pr uh, which present chip logic just like outbound processor uh, does it mm, and device capabilities uh, of various parts. That means that uh, every processor that has this JTAG capability uh, has additional silicon to support debugging and naturally if you want to use this you have to have some sort of slot uh, connection interface on board. You connect to JTAG through a cable and yeah, you do your stuff and it uh, works just like ice. You know. So you put your breakpoints in, you change your dependencies, you get Heisenbachs. Uh, so how we deal with it? Just to sum up, we have no resources to run a program and debug at the same time. When we debug via printf, we uh, change the dependencies in the code and we get Heisenbachs. Uh, if we do ICE or in-circuit debugging, we change dependencies in the code and we get Heisenbachs. And on top of that, emulators are costly, inconvenient and costly. Oh, and one more thing. The you have to connect are the ICE or JTAG to your board. And even if the connector costs two cents, if you do millions of devices, mm, it matters. So you have two versions of hardware, most likely one without the connection, the connector and one with. Uh, so you have two versions of hardware for production and debug and you have different dependencies and again you have Heisenbachs. Oh, and on top of that, uh, if you debug communication interface, this is pure fun because you usually debug just one side of communication. So you put the breakpoint in, but the other side is still running. So it's pure fun because it's just one shoot. Yeah? It's just this one uh, stops, th this one not, gets errors. So when you want to debug again, you have to reset both devices. How we deal with it? We don't. We just accept it. It's nothing to be done. When you see the Heisenberg, okay, you know this is Heisenberg and you are in world uh, of pain and you just try your best. After all, most of embedded systems work after all. All right, we have programs. Let's go back to the hardware. Hardware platform of choice in 2019 was either proprietary or custom design. Uh, please don't ask me about the difference. But in general, it's quite rare in comparison that you do a uh, form factor or board that is already established and must produced by, by someone like Arduino or Raspberry Pi. Okay, it's quite a large uh, number, 
but when you uh, look at the volume of production, those custom designs and proprietary um, are kings. But uh, okay, but it's still uh, quite a lot. And I told you about bomb and how it's important the bill of materials is. So what what about bomb? Okay, just imagine that I channel Yoda here. If you don't plan to sell millions, bomb matters not. If you just do a couple of thousand devices, you don't even need those hardware guys. You just buy off-the-shelf Raspberry Pi. You have tooling, you have open source, you have uh, modern languages. You can develop the software rapidly. Also, if you don't plan, uh, if you plan to sell for millions, bomb matters not. If you do a space telescope, it's already very, 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 very expensive. So if you, your hardware is custom built and uh, mm, just for this application, uh, it matters not. And if your company is not run by accountants by but uh, visionaries and technology uh, technologies again bill of materials matters not uh, raspberry pi for example quite an expensive hardware platform has this uh, uh, feature it has two hdmi ports and it supports uh, 4k video on both ports so it's quite often used for led um, billboards or things like that. This is uh, this photo I've taken on uh, railroad station here in Wrocław. Uh, this is the departure arrival table. Apparently, someone uh, hung it upside down. And if you do everything cup, uh, custom built and bomb is very high, you need to sell your products uh, for a mm, certain amount of money, just like Tesla does. But again, this company is not run by accountants. I, I don't think so. But still, hardware is a challenge if you do this custom slash proprietary design. And working with hardware, guys, is a challenge. For most of the time, during development of embedded systems, Hardware and software are pr produced in parallel at the same time. There is a process called board bring up, for example, when you already have this prototype of electronics, you have to power it up, debug it, and put the uh, initial software inside in order to support your further development process. It's sometimes very hard to decide whether the bug you observe, either this is a Heisen bug or other type of Byzantine bugs, whether this is a hardware or software bug. A simple example that it's known for uh, in electronics, you have uh, communication lanes on your board, solder uh, lanes, and if you put data in, from software point of view, this is just, you know, enable communication interface and putting zeros and ones inside. From the electronics point of view, you have some electrical current in this lane. And electrical current has this peculiar feature that it creates a magnetic field. And sometimes this magnetic field can influence the lane that is very near the other lane. This is called crosstalk and sometimes it's very hard to find it. If you find it here, you're lucky because you know you have uh, uh, crosstalk bug, but uh, this is uh, one of the sources uh, of the bugs that you really can't decide whether this is a hardware or software. The other thing is that you can break, completely destroy your hardware just by software. You can burn it, uh, you can make it unprogrammable, bad thing happened. Both hardware and software have to be aware about the constraints and this works in both directions. You want more memory, you go to hardware guys and they say sorry we don't have enough plays on board, not to mention the bomb. They want some monitoring feature and you say no this is too complicated to implement, we don't know how to do it and it will take too much memory uh, uh, so we can't run it. 
The other set of challenges comes from the fact that BOM is thing. You don't have enough memory, you don't have big enough processor, and if you do, the hardware guys complain that we have a heat problem. We also have to work very closely during the hardware production because you want to your production to be repeatable. You want to have the same device every time it leaves the, uh, the production lane. In order to do that, you have to make a production test. This is especially important in cases where you can't repair your hardware. You can't repair the hardware on Mars. You can't, most of the time, you can't repair hardware on orbit. Um, most likely, you won't be uh, repairing hardware in your microwave oven. So the only thing you can repair sometimes is software. Your hardware must be rock solid. Last but not least, we have to support hardware guys with testing during uh, the operation of the system. So we have to implement power on self-tests, te self posts, and periodically run built-in self-tests. I said that the only thing that changes in embedded system is the software. And this is usually true. The hardware platform is cut in stone. Once you've done it, you close the project, you produce. If there is a bug in hardware, well, you have to see fix in soft in it in software somehow. In order to do that, you need a software management, you need a software update process, which has to be rock solid. This is the first thing that has to work and it has to work flawlessly. Because if you break the satellite, there is no one there to connect to it with a JTAG and reflash the device. Uh, of course, in things like microwaves, you do the software once and that's it. You cannot update it anymore. Please remember that catastrophic failures are catastrophic. I'm talking about Toyota, I'm talking about Boeing, hundreds of people died because of the software bugs. I'm also talking about things like Hubble Telescope. Okay, no one died, but it was a PR catastrophe and took a lot, lot, lot uh, of money in order to fix the damn thing. Naturally, right now, it works flawlessly, still. Fantastic piece of machinery. You also have to plan for obsolescence. Yeah, you know what planned obsolescence uh, is. Your device uh, passes away just after guarant guarantee uh, is, uh, is expired. But you also have to plan for unplanned obsolescence. You do your hardware device from pieces. You buy them from vendors. What happens if your vendor suddenly says, sorry, I don't carry this processor anymore. Have a nice day. What will you do if your nuclear launch missile system uses 8-inch floppy disks? Some of you don't, uh, haven't even seen a floppy disk outside museum or use it to that matter. This technology, the whole concept, is completely obsolete. Still, uh, Americans uh, rolled out 8-inch uh, floppies in 2019, last year. You also have to think about forward compatibility. What if your system is replaced by another system which is new? You have to design your system in such a way that it will accept the input needed for later version of itself. Sometimes it's not possible because of the failure of imagination. Look at the guys that designed uh, monophonic radio. They haven't got a clue that in a few years we will find out that, okay, having two speakers instead of one is a great idea. You have one wave, and you have one speaker. 
Okay, so if you, you, you have uh, left and right speaker, naturally you will have one uh, wave, uh, um, the, the, the carrier wave for left speaker and the other for, uh, for the right speaker. No. They, uh, people that made uh, stereo radio had to do uh, backward compatibility in order to uh, monophonic radios to be forward compatible. The original wave is for some of the signals and this new wave is uh, uh, f uh, for the difference between left and right. That way, you when you uh, use uh, monophonic radio, you can do stereo just on one speaker. It's so, co you know, it's uh, so complicated and so expensive. It makes the, the hardware of the stereophonic radios more expensive but you cannot tell people okay you bought this radio for god knows how much uh, how much money and you have to throw it away because we have another idea right now all right so how we live with all that we look at embedded systems as sort of puzzle jigsaw puzzle with pieces that interlock only in one way. You can force pieces together sometimes, but the resulting picture is usually not what you see on the box. And we do solve this puzzle. Uh, we do it in uh, also in time dimension because over the whole life of embedded system, conception, prototyping, board bring up, debugging, testing, release, and maintenance, maintenance, ma maintenance, and repeat, we need to have flexibility. We need to think about the future all the time. And this flexibility during the life cycle is not only about the initial code, it's also about the quality, the documentation. All code in embedded system, will eventually be a legacy code. So you have docu to document it, you have to comment it, you have to think about your future self in a year. Your future self will most probably even won't remember that you have written this code and uh, will not understand your brilliant creative ideas you had a year ago. You have to take care of that. The bugs you find during uh, development, before software release, are like gifts. You can't wait for people to, to, to give you gifts. The earlier the proce uh, process errors are caught, the cheaper they are to fix. And it's better for everyone. Testing and quality go hand in hand. And there is one more important thing about embedded guys. We fight the urge. We fight the urge to optimize early and often. We implement the features, we make them work, we test them out, and then we make them smaller, more efficient, faster as needed. And we need to pick our battles. We have to m uh, make sure that we understand where our resources are being used before we start tuning. But still, the future is bright. Embedded will still be everywhere, and you probably hear a lot about the Internet of Things and 5G. It's right now on the peak of inflated expectations. And we will go to the plateau of productivity uh, in the end, but it will still take a couple of years. I hope you are not discouraged by my talk. Uh, Despite all those challenges, constraints, and torments, it's a fun topic. Uh, it's uh, an exciting place to be in, and I've never imagined when I started almost 20 years ago that I would stay in this embedded community for uh, so long. Even if I discouraged you um, from getting your feet wet, I at least hope that I made you aware of the hell we are living in, and please remember the bomb will still be king. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Thank you for your wonderful talk. A lot of energy early in the morning. 
Uh, stay with us, don't go away, and we'll proceed with our next talk shortly.
Hello, welcome back. Our second speaker today is Karol Przybylski. Now, Karol works as a research and development engineer, and he's involved in hardware <coughs> verification of Nokia's 5G telecom modules. His interests are embedded technology and applications. In his spare time, he likes to search for absurd humor and play story heavy games. Now, a word of warning, speaking of absurd humor, during this presentation, you are going to see at least one cat. Other than that, effective code review. Carol, take it away. Thank you for your warm introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to this presentation. My name is Karol Przybylski, and this is effective code review. I will be talking about my own experiences with code review process and how to make it a little bit better. In the first part of the presentations, I'm going to talk a bit about general issues regarding code review. In second part, I will be talking about some automated tooling. And the third part will be more soft skilled oriented. So in the case of me versus code review, I am judge, jury and the prosecution. I work as an R&D engineer at Nokia. I like tinkering with embedded hardware and software. And my favorite burger sauce is mayonnaise and peanut butter. And I know some of you will say that this is disgusting, but believe me, it's actually pretty good. Y you have to try it. If you have any follow-up questions, don't be afraid to hit me up on my email or wherever else for a follow-up discussion. So let's also cover what is not on the agenda today. I will not be talking about the rules that we all know. If something is easily Googleable in five seconds, or maybe you can ask your teammate about advice on, on the code review, then go ahead and do it. I will not be talking about something you can easily Google. Also, I will not be giving any language specific hints. If I have any examples, they will be Python oriented. But other than that, no language specific. My presentation is pretty abstract. Also, I don't want to talk about things you can find in every style guide. If you want an example of good style guide, you can Google C++ style guide used in Google or something like this. It's very, very easy to find and I recommend you to give it a read. And uh, let's start with some small questions. You can ask this question yourself or you can air your grievances in the chat. Do you enjoy doing code review? Do you wake up in the morning thinking about those five big fat reviews waiting for you? Do you enjoy this process? I have some predictions about what the answer will be. And I think that the consensus among developers is that code review is not enjoyable, but it is essential. And actually, one of my very good friends uh, in my team compared code review process to waking up in the morning. You know you have to do it. It is an essential part of your day. You have to get up, go to work, earn money, do stuff, whatever. But you just don't want to do this. You keep pushing it and pushing it farther away. You hit that snooze, snooze button multiple times. But in the end, you always just know that you have to do it. And it's very similar with code review. So since we all know that code review is essential, let's ask ourselves the question, why is it essential? And in here, I have a quite interesting example of the Cluster Spacecraft. The Cluster Spacecraft was a project of European Space Agency of a spacecraft that was supposed to be launched in French Guiana, go to the magnetosphere of the Earth, and conduct some uh, scientific sp experiments there. It was a very, very expensive project. It took many years of R&D, planning the experiments, designing the spacecraft, spacecraft and, ev and everything. However, 37 seconds after it's launched, the spacecraft veered off of its course and landed straight into the ground, as you can see on this beautiful picture. And it cost $370 million in losses. Many hours of designing scientific experiments just went to waste. It was a very, very costly mistake. And as you maybe are thinking now, the reason for this was a software error and a very simple one. The cause of this was the overflow. Overflow is basically computer science 101. 
everyone who has ever programmed anything has met with a condition of overflow. And it's very, very basic. It seems that on certain developer level, I it's just too easy to make such mistakes, but yet people do it all the time. And the demise of cluster spacecraft was overflow. And let's now examine how did this happen exactly. So first of all, a data conversion of 64-bit floating point to a 16-bit signed integer value occurred. That was the overflow that happened. Then the operand error was not an anticipated by the ADA code. ADA was the language of embedded systems. Back in the day, it was a bit rival to the C. However, obviously, C1 and C++, but it was still a bit popular in the day. And this operand error caused the system was not able to recover from software error. The software completely locked hardware. It locked the, s the first processor and it locked the backup processor. Also, the initial reference system was shut down. This system was the component of the spacecraft, of the hardware of the spacecraft, that was supposed to keep the spacecraft on its course, but it failed, it shut down, and then it went straight to the ground. There was also a plethora of other issues with this spacecraft, aside from the overflow and everything that occurred after. So there was design mistake because software was able to completely lock hardware. This should have never happened. This is just bad design. There should be a way to recover, maybe on the backup processor, but in this example, both the first and backup processor just failed. Also, there was requirements mistake because the failing code was actually a part of that code from the previous project. It, it was, it was just copy paste. This code wasn't even supposed to do anything, and yet that was the part that failed. And management mistake. They all, all, almost always go with, with each other. Inconsistent code, flawed review process. It all led to this disaster. And the conclusion is following. Would code review have saved it? Now, I don't have an answer to this question. I don't know. It's not stated direc directly in the report if code review if a pros proper process of code review would have saved this project. However, as you know, the integer overflow condition is, is pretty simple. Maybe if someone had looked at the code and looked at it very, very carefully, they maybe it would have been spotted, but it wasn't. However, one of the good things that followed after was a large scale static code analysis. It was biggest at the time. It was early 2000s and every single line of code had to be analyzed in order to prepare a report. So a lot of backfinding tools and static code analyzers, analyzers were born after this accident. So another conclusion that we can draw from this is that you should automate every single thing that you can, because people make a lot of stupid mistakes. People are often the most valuable asset of a, of a company. And we are not g good at doing repetitive, boring things like checking formatting rules, class variable names, commit messages. All of those tasks can be made by a machine because it's repetitive, it's boring. You can put a regex into your commit message checker and just leave it like this. Don't waste precious human potential on something that can be done by the machine. So leave all of the boring stuff to them. It will serve your time and you know, it's just good. Also, machines can replace you as being the bad cop in your team. It's pretty important because when you wake up and you see a message like this, so your review just got 39 comments, it's not looking good. And also I, as a person who writes those comments, I'm not feeling good. In this case, most of the comments were about formatting rules, class names and so on and so on. So even though the comments are pretty small and insignificant. Many of them make me feel like the bad guy, you know? The, uh, 39 issues to one person, it's too much. They will hate me after a while. So you can just leave this to the machine and let her, the machine, be the bad guy. Instead of writing 39 comments, you could write four comments and rest leave to the machine. And if you are looking for an inspiration of where to find stuff that will check a everything for you, you can use GitHub Marketplace. Now, this is a screenshot that I have made 
some days ago, and there's so much stuff in there. You have things for chat, code quality, code review, continuous integration, continuous deployment, every single thing. Also with the machine learning, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Even sometimes I wonder if maybe if I downloaded them all, all every single plugin available, maybe the project would be coded and reviewed and deployed by itself. Or maybe you could do it like in Skyrim. Keep downloading and installing plugins until your repository crashes. Very good source for inspiration. Or you can just use Jenkins with plugins. The, the possibilities are basically limitless in this case. And uh, if you are talking about Jenkins and continuous integration in general, I actually have a personal story involved uh, with my team when we were trying, when we finally did introduce continuous integration in our team. And I have to build this up a little bit before I get to the meat. However, my team and also Nokia, but mostly my team, was going through a period of changes shortly before and I joined Nokia in 2017. And as someone has said, to improve is to change. So all of those changes were good, but there was a lot of them. Like, we were moving from SVN to Git. First GitLab, then Gerrit. So for those of you who experienced such transformation, you know that learning a new workflow, a new tool, always takes a bit of effort. and as VN versus Git, there's a lot of differences and you have to remember about it. You have to learn new things. Also, we are moving from our programs written mostly in Trickle, C, Python and some Bash to as much Python free as possible. Again, this was very, very good change. However, if you want to learn a new language or deepen your knowledge in new language, you have to give it time. You have to commit many hours in, in order to get better at programming in this language. Also, we had our custom test executor, which was based in Tickl, but we were moving to the Eclipse-based one. And you know, you could say that now basically everyone knows Eclipse. However, this software still is very, very big, and for someone who has never used it before, it can take quite some time before he or she is able to leverage all of the func functionalities. And on top of that, Nokia itself was going through a series of enterprise changes. So we were going in hardware software development from mostly waterfall style of project management to something more agile. So if you want to hear more about it, you can revisit my talk about this issue from the last year. So you, um, you might ask yourself, where is the continuous integration? Where is the CI in, of the in all of this? We have so many fun new tools, but CI is also a very important piece of, of the puzzle here. So we also were asking us a question, how can we implement CI and get people to use and like it? And you might say that, hey, they don't have to like this. It's it's job like any other, you know? You just get told that you from now you have to use CI and there, there is no choice. However, in these circumstances, we were also in during the crucial flagship project and there was also those many changes that I was talking about on the previous slide. So we couldn't just say, hey, use it from now on because at our team there were many s more senior engineers working and having so many changes is sometimes hard for people. So we wanted to make it as seamless as possible for everyone. And the flagship project was actually this. This is RSK module used in modern Enode Bs that we were uh, developing in R&D at the time. So in order to introduce CI seamlessly, we decided to, make to use a mix of Jenkins, PyLint, and gamification. And it turned out to be quite a good solution. So first of all, let's talk about what is gamification. Maybe some of you has heard this term, maybe not. And it is defined, as it says in this very, very interesting study that is listed by, by down below. I recommend you to watch it. 
gamification is application of game design principles in a non-gaming context. So we are not making a game, we are not developing a game, but we are taking the fun parts of playing a game and applying it to our business in order to make people like some process more or to sell mo more stuff to your clients. We are only taking the fun stuff and using it for, for our purposes. Because gamers, when they are playing a game, and I think every one of you has at some point in their life played the game, gamers are, are engaged and they want to play the game. You know, in their free time, they are not getting paid for it unless they are doing it competitively. So we want to recreate this feeling in gamification. And the examples of gamifications are, for example, game achievements, badges, or redeemable points. They are pretty common, they cost nothing, they don't give you any real life advantage, and yet it's very, very fun to get them and to earn them. And we also, in order to understand gamification, we also have to ask ourselves a question, why do we play games at all? Why do we bother? And in this second very, very interesting study, going into deep depths of gamification, we have two things. We have motivations behind playing a game and what makes games engaging for us. So first of all, the motivations. The motivations are two. First, there's extrinsic motivation, the rewards. So when you are playing a game for a longer time, you are putting much effort into it, you are gaining, for example, achievements. And you feel good about achievements. Everyone likes to be rewarded, everyone likes to be appreciated. So this is one of the motivations. Then later you can show those achievements to your friends or whatever and, and gain even more respect. Then we have intrinsic motivation and that is satisfaction. So if we are putting a lot of effort into something, a lot of hard work, we are trying to be as good as possible and we finally overcome some challenge, then we are feeling satisfied. For example, you were fighting a boss in the game for 16 hours and at the end you had to learn a lot of new things. You have to apply them in the game. And after beating this boss, even though it changed absolutely nothing in the real world, you are more satisfied. And the engagements are actually caused by three things. Challenge, fantasy and curiosity. So challenge is di directly related to the difficulty level of a game. The more difficult the game is, the more challenge it gives you. And if you finally overcome this challenge, you are feeling a lot of satisfaction. It applies to everyone. Then there is fantasy. Fantasy is related to the situations where you are playing a game and, for example, you are using some in-game skill. You know, you are fighting dragons or something like this, casting a spell. And it's it relates to the things that are happening in a player's mind. Now, instead of being a boring developer, you are a mage fighting drago dragons. And it's fun. It's fun to imagi Im imagine such things. And then there's curiosity. So people have natural tendency to like to listen to stories. We want to know more about the characters, what happens, and we, we want to know more about the, about the world. So if a game puts us in a situation where we don't know everything about the world we are in, then we are curious, we want to learn more, we want to get more knowledge about this. And also, when the source of the positive information is yourself, it is renewable. If you as a human being is the source of positive emotions, then you can repeat it and gain even more satisfaction and just feel happier in your life. And this is one of the illustrations of gamification, challenge and curiosity. So in this particular game, a player attained certain score, so 200 something stars and the, the top score is 350. So for many people, not everyone, but for many people, they will just say that, man, I have to repeat this level. I have to play this again, this again, because I want to get all of the stars possible at this level. We have our inner completionist that will not rest until all of the stars are gathered. And who knows, maybe if you get all of them, you get some new weapon or new skin. 
You don't know. So you want to satisfy this challenge. You want to beat the game. You want to get all of the stars. And also you are curious what happens if you do get all of them. And you want to leverage those feelings also in our CI. Challenge and curiosity. So then we have the second part of the, of the mix that is Pilint. So Pilint is an open source static analysis tool. It's very, very popular uh, among Python developers. It's very, very good. It checks for a lot of stuff. Formatting errors, code smells, other errors, refactoring tips, and so on and so on. It's very, very highly configurable. So you can do almost everything with it. Write regex for class checking and name checking, calculate a score. It's pretty good. And we wanted to integrate this with Jenkins. And in order to integrate it with Jenkins, we had to use a Pilint plugin. And actually, it's not Pilint plugin, but next generation warnings plugin that you can see at the bottom of the presentation. It's rather easy to integrate with Jen Jenkins and with your project. And it its biggest advantage is that it, it's that it gives you a very, very clear report of your errors. Everything is listed, every single mistake that you've made, it clearly points you to the line in your code where you made the mistake. You can see it, check it, and it's very, very easy. Like this. You shouldn't have used that name, use another name. Very easy. And now let's get to the basics of implementation of our system. So first of all, a change is pushed to Garrett in order to be reviewed. Jenkins pulls the change, so the bot that is behind Jenkins. The Jenkins bot performs pilot analysis of submitted code, so it scans all of the changed files. So he looks at what files were in the project in the previous commit and which are in this commit. And with this difference, he gets the number of files that he has to scan, line by line, checking for errors. Then a pilot score is posted to the review page. Because Pilint has a feature that it, ca it can calculate a score of how good the posted code was. And the calculation is performed in the pipeline script and in Pilint RC. And it looks like this. So you have evaluation is the Pilint score that you are getting at the end. It can never be greater than 10. The biggest weight is put on errors, then warnings, then refactoring and convention. So it's from minus infinity towards 10. 10 out of 10 is the best code that you have ever seen. And then 5 out of 10 is meh, then 0 is worse, and under 0 it's pretty bad. So we introduced it like I have just told you, and of course at the beginning we had some initial problems, because I thought that, you know, we are great programmers, we are going to just get 10 out of 10 all the time. However, it did not look at this. First changes were more like this. And you can also see that here the, the implementation of hyphen is actually not very successful because it looks like minus minus. So that would give you a plus, but it's actually minus. Minus 8 out of 10. It wasn't very good. A lot of people, somewhere, some people had better scores, some worse. And uh, that is my personal record. So minus 900 over. I was merging some third-party code to our repository. It wasn't written by me, of course. And uh, yeah, minus 900 is pretty, pretty bad. It's almost on the verge of being impossible to, to fix. However, after some time, we've noticed that the gamif gamification principles started working because people on their own started to push new changes because they were seeing that the score that are they are getting is not 10 out of 10, it's something else. And they wanted to get this 10 out of 10. So they were on their own checking the report because it, it was very easy to check it. They were checking the report, checking the errors they've made and pushing new change. Remember, it wasn't mandatory because we had a lot of deadlines and we were rushing towards the end of the project. So they were doing this on their own and finally the effect was pretty good. You know? Soon after, we could introduce the mandatory rule that all code has to be 10 out of 10. But using this gamification technique, along with very good plug plugins, allowed us to introduce our CI seamlessly and later scale it. 
And there are a few important notes that we have to remember. First is that we you should clearly communicate the gamification results. So posting message. This message is being posted to the review page of your code. And uh, you can see here it's not very good. It just says starting analysis and they, then it says failure with a link to the to the report. So you don't know anything. You don't know if you are 10 out of 10 or 5 out of 10. So there's no feedback to the user, so nobody will bother to use it. So you have to remember to make it better, to present this in easy way for pe for the people. In here, you can see that the message is posted, your pilot's code is 10 out of 10. Your pilot's code is 5 out of 10. So the person most, lik most likely will get curious what mistakes did he do or she, and he will check it and then thanks to the clear communication, it will be just better for everyone. However, I think we all know that bots can't do everything. As you can see from the sad robot, he is sad because he knows he can't do everything. Computers are dumb. They just can calculate stuff quickly. So we have to turn to people for the help. And actually it can be proven that bots can't do everything. In here I have a very, very interesting study that compared the backfinding tools to the review effects. Basically the scientists took uh, free backfinding tools and applied it for several open source projects written in Java and they had the following conclusions. Backfinding tools detect a subset of the defect types that can be found by a review. Dynamic tests find completely different defects than backfinding tools. Backfinding tools have a significant ratio of false positives. And backfinding tools show very different results in different projects. So taking all of those into account, we can clearly see that you can never replace a good code review process with machine that just checks for errors because it's ha it has so many issues. You can check this study for, for more about this, but only when you take the people who will do review will answer questions about design, about some more complicated things. And then you take the machines that are performing the bug finding and uh, static code analy analysis. Only then can you merge them together and have something that will produce a good piece of software. So now that we know that we have to turn to the people to the rescue. And another colleague of mine said once that he did not become programmer in order to talk to people. But unfortunately, in order to produce good code, we have to sometimes talk with each other <laughs> and communicate clearly. And to make it easy, we have to answer another question. What is code review? So code review is communication. Communication is talking with people. And code review is art of talking with caring but sometimes difficult people. Because when we care about our job a lot, we are sometimes starting to get defensive about, about our ideas. And sometimes we are difficult to work with. So code review is often an art of talking with difficult people, communicating them. And s most people in lower or higher doses have actually a type of mindset that they have. They think that it is possible to create perfect software. My brain cannot be wrong. If I don't find any errors, then I have created perfect software. My code is me. Anyone who criticizes my code criticizes me. And you have to realize that these are, are all lies. They are just not true. I think the worst one is my code is me because I've seen it a lot of times and also I see it in myself often. Because when you care about your work, when you put a lot of effort in it and then someone comes and criticizes you, you will not like it. And if someone says that, your, hey, your for loop is dumb, he's not saying that your loop is dumb, he's saying that you are dumb. <laughs> and you just have to forget about this mindset and you have to apply the correction to this mindset. And that is, software has mistakes. You are not your code, but you are responsible for the errors. 
and you can never never eliminate all errors only reduce their probability and you can combat these issues by communication it's the easiest way and it works most of the time if you know how to do it right and those things are actually excerpts from very very good book by Z show learn C the hard way mostly it's about C but also he gives some tips on uh, how to deal with people so our goal when we are in the process of code review is to do not provoke non-productive conflict because non-productive conflict is something that can destroy entire teams if you have non-productive conflict then you don't want to work with each other instead of talking you start screaming at each other it's not a good environment to work you want to not have it at all costs and you also want to create environment of mutual learning because code review is a very good tool for this if you are invited for review on so of someone else's code you can see how this other person is doing things maybe he's doing something better maybe he knows some techniques that you don't know it's very very good tool for this and you also just want to match the goddamn change because we are all at work we want to get our work done we want to merge the change put our ticket into the done column and be done with it and not rage merge and it's also worth to remember that it's not about all about error checking in code review in there was a interesting study performed uh, by the guys that are listed below on the slide and they conducted a study among more, more than 800 developers at Microsoft in which they ask about the developers motivation behind doing code review and let's take a look at this you can see that the first two positions are pretty obvious it's finding defects and code improvement Th that's why we do it I it's the basic reason and also most of the management also tells that's why we do code review to get rid of the bugs however take a look at third and fourth place alternative solutions and knowledge transfer so people are not doing code review only to check for errors but they want also want to learn that they want to do as much of self-development as possible it's also very very important for them and we have to remember about this so let's not make a code review a chore but a way to develop our programming skills so now let's get to the bottom of the communication and let's learn how to write comments because the pen is mightier than the sword and it all begins with words so first of all please no exclamation points I can't actually believe that I have to tell this but you wouldn't believe how many times I had problems with this so when someone gives me a comment with exclamation points I will interpret it as screaming and when someone is screaming at me I will start screaming at them and this will be just a spiral of violence going all the way up and I will read all of your comments people read all of the comments please reserve one exclamation point only for life and death situation also don't use, use caps lock because it's also screaming and maybe you have been wondering why caps lock is screaming so here's an answer here is the first post from not internet but, but intranet that dealt with the issue of caps lock L take a look at the date 1984 back then people were starting to think why caps lock is interpreted as screaming and it was consensus at the time that caps lock is screaming and you shouldn't scream at people unless you want to but i sh want to believe that you don't want to scream at each other in comments during code review then you have to remember that you should always feed comments to the person because when you are talking with someone less experienced that someone new in your team or whatever then you should be as verbose as possible explain to them more stuff than to someone who you have been working with for years and someone who trust for example instead of writing just this can be optimized you can write this can be optimized like this so if someone has an inefficient for loop 
in his code. If you trust him, if you know that he's able to research and so on, then you can just say optimize this. But if you know that person might be struggling, you can help them out. Be more verbose. You all will you will all learn something from this. And also, if you have some good sources of knowledge, because you are more experienced at something, you should always cite them. So, for example, in Python, you will s write a comment to someone that, hey, you should use assert keyword for this. And of course, this person will go to Google and check the first result for the assert keyword. And we all know that very often the first few results from Google can be crap. So if you are more senior member of your team, if you know more something about a particular issue, you can give them sources in order to learn. So, are, so they will be become better programmers and your job will also be easier. And also if you are talking about seniors, this post from Stack Exchange actually highlights why it, I it is so important to com communicate very, very nicely. So developer in this post had a problem with code review, basically that more junior members of his team were not doing review of his code. So let's read it. At a previous company, I had a manager who would have to intervene from time to time. Once he raged merged all my pull requests that were open for more than two weeks because the rest of my team was not reviewing my work. And I especially like the raged merge expression I started using it a lot after reading this. So the advice given to this person was that maybe his teammates were afraid of doing his code review. And it often happens if you have a super reviewers in your team. And they might be afraid to, to challenge you. So you have to communicate with them, show them how to do it, guide them through process, and then they, they will learn on, on their own. So now that we know how to write, com write comments for the review, let's uh, talk a bit about how to talk to people. Because that's the fastest way of communication. You can write comment, you can write comments all day, but you know, it's easy to get lost in the comments. It's way easier for us to express ourselves in speech than in writing. So first of all, you have to listen. That's actually not related to talking, but it's very, very important to listen to others because we all want to be respected. We all want to be listened to. And it's not easy to listen, but once you get the patience to do it, it will pay off a lot because you don't know what other person is thinking. You might think that you know, but until you listen to another person, you will not never know this. The more you listen, the more you learn about other people's motivation, problems, goals, and so on. So here, this subject is very, very broad, but here are some few tips that you can use when you are talking with people to listen better. First of all, defer judgment and rebuttal. So how many times in conversation did you have a situation when you are talking with someone in a heated argument, maybe about something that you both care about, and instead of listening to other person, you start thinking about your own response. Response: Oh my God, how am I going to respond to the problem? You are not listening to him or her. You are only thinking about yourself. And it's a very, very big sign of disrespect when you are only thinking about yourself. So let people finish what they are talk, what they are saying, and then start talking on your own. Because that way you will just learn more. And you will not have two people monologuing, but two people talking with each other. Also, show that you are listening. You should give feedback to other person. That's called active listening. And actually, it's a very, very broad subject. You can check out more in the sources that I have below in Never Split the Difference and Having Difficult Conversations. It's a very big subject. You could have a 30-hour lecture only about this. But I just wanted to spark your interest in this topic. And also remember that we wouldn't have any electronics without feedback. You know, the output gives information to the input and input changes. So if we can't have any electronics without it, then maybe we also can't have 
conversations without feedback. And also remember to listen, not to be polite, but to learn about other person or other people. There, there is a saying I once read that if you have learned nothing new during a conversation, nothing surprising, then you didn't have a good conversation. You can learn a lot about people you are working with just by listening. What are their problems? What are their goals? What do they feel about you and their work? It's very, very useful. Then we cannot forget about smiling because in Western culture, at least that's the culture I was born in and raised, we trust smiling people. And trusting people are cooperative people. And it's actually proven by science that smiling feels good when we are talking to a smiling person. And there's actually a very interesting study conducted seeing is believing the effects of smiling among the people. And the scientists took a bunch of students, like they, like they often do in the experiments, and they showed the students two images. One with a man who is smiling, and another man with a man who is frowning. And they asked students which one of these persons is more cooperative, trustful, easy to work with, angry. There were also other things, but those were the most important. And guess what? It's easy to say smiling person was, for the students, more cooperative, trustful, easy to work with to work with. It's just natural for us. We are doing it on our own. Also, in later stage of this experiment, students actually could gamble money against frowning or smiling people, and they were giving more money to smiling people. So, you know, there's a reason why in every single commercial of a product, in every single advertisement, there are smiling people, because smiling people make us feel good about ourselves. It tickles our, our neurons in a way that makes us happy and co cooperative. And also, let's not forget about the tone of our voice. It's also very important, but people very, very often forget about it. It's not just what, but also how. Because it's very hard to process what another person is telling us. It takes a lot of processing power in order to process the sense of the words. But it takes very, very small amount of processing power to tell if someone smells bad, if he's smiling, if he's talking in a nice way, or, or how she or he is looking. It's very, very important. We are analyzing, our brains are analyzing whole package, not just the content of, someone, of what someone is saying. So it's important to remember that voice is a base of understanding and that we mirror each other. Almost from the day that we are learning social interactions, we are hardwired to mirror one another. So if some person is smiling and you are talking to her, you are also starting to smile. If some person is talking in a calm voice, then you will also start talking in a calm voice. That's just who we are. And if you will master smile and calming voice, then you will become the ultimate, gu ultimate guy everyone would like to work with. That's Bob Ross. For those of you who don't know who that is, he was a painting tutor who had a very, very popular uh, show about where he was teaching people how to paint. But I've read that 19% of people watching this show never even started to paint. Among them was were also me, because I, I would never start to paint. I, I don't want to take up such, such ac activity. But with him, it was just a joy to listen to his voice and his smile. He was a very positive person. And if you could choose to work with Bob Ross or anybody else, then most likely most people would choose Bob Ross. That's a perfect example of why, smi of why smile and calming voice works for everyone. And also there's a bit of negotiator's advice on how should we talk with people written by Chris Voss, a very experienced negotiator. So, according to a negotiator, we should have three voices available. The first one is the voice of a late-night DJ. 
deep and calming. If you have never listened to the radio at night, then that explanation should be enough for you. You know, it's night, everyone is tired, at least most of the people. So the DJs at the time have deep and calming vo voices. This voice calms other people. It's very, very useful. And also, you should have a positive and playful voice. It's laid back, encouraging. That's the type of the voice that you are using when you are talking with your friends. It's encouraging. People want to work with you. They want to do stuff. It's, it's pretty useful. This voice should be the most used by you when talking with someone. And there's, there's the third type of voice, which is direct, assertive, dominating. So this voice requires control from someone. And people will listen to you for a while. But, you know, if someone is requesting a control from us all the time, then we are getting just tired of it. And, and it's nobody likes to work with some people. Positive and playful voice is what you should use all the time. And if you want to calm someone down, then you should just start talking slowly, calmly. Just imagine you are having a radio night for a very tired people that want to sleep and use the voice like this. No, instead of being silent, obviously. And my key points that I hope you will remember from this presentation is that you should automate everything. Automate as much stuff as you can because people make stupid mistakes. And machines are better at repetitive and boring stuff. Also, play video games. It's not just for fun, but you are learning about gamification, so it's just just play video games. Also be polite, especially when you are on the brink of meltdown. And believe me, I know that keeping your voice calm and smiling when the another person annoys the hell out of you is very, very hard and it takes a lot of practice to master it. But believe me that it will pay off. Also listen and respect others. Because everyone wants to be respected, everyone wants to be little listened to and appreciated. Also remember to smile, because smiling tickles the good neurons in everyone's brains. And speak like a late night radio host, because everyone likes such type of voice. And lastly, remember that real code review was the friends we made along the way. Thank you. Karol Przybylski. Karol, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, code review. I'm going to announce a break now, and I'd like to take some of your advice. So first of all, I'm going to smile. And then which voice would you like? Encouraging. Encouraging. OK, everyone, let's take a break. Don't go away, please, and do come back. I'd like to announce a break, but please do come back because we're going to have another wonderful presentation. And I'm going to finish my sentence not with an exclamation mark, but with a decent and polite full stop.
Hello again. Our next speaker is Kamil Vitecki. Now, Kamil works as an experienced architect and chief engineer here at Nokia. He can program in a plethora of languages, and his weapons of choice are C++ and Lua. Kamil has a lot of personal interests. He's interested in literature, abstract humor, playing electric guitar, and, well, public speaking. He's a veteran speaker here at CodeDive. Now, uh, during the pandemic, Kamil has lost 20 kilos. So if you don't recognize him on stream, well, that's fine. But doesn't he look amazing? Kamil, over to you. Thank you, Rafael, for this warm introduction. I'm Kamil Vitecki. And during my career, I was building different solutions. I have started from building websites with front and back end and some database. I was integrating e-commerce systems with third party services with other vendors. Right now at Nokia, I am building the future of telecommunications working on 5G base stations. And I would like today to share with you what I learned about software compatibility and why it's so important to plan it already today, as later on there will be consequences to face. Before we jump into the topic, let's see how Merriam-Webster defines that very word, the compatibility or compatible. Before we will go there, though, the disclaimer, this presentation is for educational purposes only. It expresses my opinions and it's in no way affiliated, authorized or endorsed by Nokia or any other institution or person it refers to. So, speaking of Merriam-Webster, the compatible is defined as either adjective or a noun and it has different meanings, None of, not all of them related to software at all. Some of them will be related to different areas of life. So from each of these definitions, we will learn something useful. We'll learn something that we can actually apply. First of all, compatible are, for example, theories or people that can coexist together in harmony. That means they will not try to fight with one another or they will not be contradicting. Then compatible can be understood as something that is able to cross-fertilize. So the, out of this compatibility, we'll be getting some fruits we can reap. Then from chemistry, we can understand compatibility as some compounds that we can mix together and they will form homogeneous mixture. They won't separate and they won't be altered by the chemical reaction. So, for example, if we have water and oil, we try to mix them, they do not mix well. They are not compatible. When we take water and salt, on the other hand, we mix them in proper proportions, we get a mixture that is homogeneous, but still inside we have water and salt. They are not altered. This is a good example of compatible compounds from chemical world. Then, from medicine, we can talk about compatibility, for example, in terms of transfusion, grafting, or transplantation. Compatible uh, kidneys, for example, won't be rejected by the body of person who takes it. This is another thing about compatibility, that things need to work together and they cannot reject one another. And last but not least, finally, we get something related to software. These are basically things that are designed to work together. We can have printer, we can have a PC, and when we connect them without any adapters, without anything in between, they will work together creating something like a printing station. And when it comes to a noun, a compatible is basically a device that was built with these principles in mind. A device that is a compatible for some kind of a system. Like this printer I mentioned, the printer itself is a compatible for that printing system in general. So now we know how the word is defined. What I would like you to remember after that session, if you forget everything, it's fine. I want you to remember these few anchors. First of all, compatibility is about things working together, bearing some fruits to reap, and keeping one another valuable. Then you might hear that if you use that or that library, you get compatibility for free. Do not listen to such voices. It's the same as somebody telling you, just hop in that Ferrari is awaiting you. This doesn't happen. If you believe that a library, a tool will give you compatibility for free, 
Well, you can also try to pet your unicorn, but I do not have a unicorn in my garden and I know that having compatibility will take work and will it will take some rules and imagination. And these rules and imagination are the third thing I want you to remember about. Compatibility takes following rules and also thinking about the future. Right now, what can change tomorrow? So what is compatibility when it comes to software? Let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go in these details. We will call compatible two pieces, two components, two applications, two embedded devices, whatever it is you are working on, only when they are having some kind of contract between them and they are working together. They coexist in harmony. They fulfill one another. If one of these pieces takes a little bit too much responsibility and tries to invade the territory of another, we won't have compatibility. If, on the other hand, both of them leave some space and do not take care about that part of be it interface functionality, whatever it is, then we'll have different kind of incompatibility, we'll have a gap. In compatibility, it's important that we follow what we agree up front. We have some kind of contract. When we are building interfaces, interfaces are our contract. And we need to make sure that we fulfill that contract from both sides. And when we are building this contract, when we are designing the contract, we have freedom. It is not said that there is only one solution to building such contracts. We can build it in one way, we can change the responsibility split. We can make more, we can move more wave to one of the components. It's fine. We can reverse dependencies between them. If we have good reason for that, it's also fine. Compatibility will not limit us here, but we need to remember that if we want compatibility, we better write down that contract between these two parts. We write down how we understood that responsibility split between them and what we wanted to achieve. When we are working alone on a project and building these two pieces and making them compatible, it's tempting to just do it because today I'm working on this part, I'm working on that part, and I know what they should do. I know what the interface shall be. And this is the very first moment this planning plays a role. We need to remember that maybe today it's fine, but tomorrow a colleague of mine will take over some part of it. Or after a year, somebody will have to replace one of these parts. So this is a moment when we write that contract down. And here, I heard a story during my studies from one of my professors. They were working on a university on a management system for the whole university. There were science people on one side and there were business people, the industry representatives on the other side. They were cooperating to build it. It was huge. It was supposed to manage lectures, classrooms, grades, everything. And of course, we had the best from both worlds. We had scientists who do computer science just for academic purposes. They know the very best about it. They know how it should be. They are defining the standards. They are defining tools to design this kind of contracts. On the other hand, we had people who do it for bread. And this was one of the top companies on the market. And they also know what they are doing and they know how to do it right because if they don't do it right, well, there is always some delayed payment. And they really take care about it from one side and another side. And there was a one tiny piece called the demo. They wanted to demo that software at some point and obviously whenever we have demo, something goes wrong. And in this example, it also went wrong and nobody knew why because both of them followed the contract, at least in theory. There was one small word there. The word was permutation and permutation has some ambiguity to it. You can understand permutation as a function that shall permute some set, some vector of values, or you can understand permutation as a result of applying such function. So either we have a function to apply that will permute something, or we have a result that is ready-made permutation. One side and the other side understood it differently. And locating that small error took weeks. Therefore, when writing this kind of contract, make sure you remove this kind of ambiguities. The just defining messages will get you started, but somehow make sure that there are no ambiguities. Use natural language if needed to say what you understood, what you meant by it. 
or ask colleague to write an example how he would use it. Make sure you address these ambiguities or there might be issues like that in future. Interfaces for is one thing about compatibility and it doesn't end here. Compatibility is also about functionality. Remember, from agriculture, we, we needed this to produce some fruits. To bear something we can reap, there must be some value. And this functionality is that value. If we have a printer, we have a computer, and in the end, we can click that print button, the printer does something, but what I get as a printout is not what I see on the screen, then it doesn't really bear the fruits. It might be perfectly compatible on an interface level, but if the printout doesn't match my expectation, the functionality wasn't provided. So when working on this kind of contract, work also on writing down your functionality. There are different tools for that. You can use UML diagrams, you can write user stories in natural language, just choose some tool and make sure you know what this functionality to provide is because this is also defining your compatibility. And in future, when you will be replacing one part of that system for any reason, you need to keep that functionality intact. And to keep it intact, you need to understand what it was in the first place. And last but not least, compatibility is about resources. We will have some limited resources we might be able to scale them or not. If we are working in cloud, we can buy additional VRAM or additional v uh, CPUs. If we are working on an embedded device, well, we cannot change it. The hardware was built, the hardware was sold. That's the environment we are ru running in. These are our constraints. We cannot change them anymore. Know your environment and be sure your applications, the parts of the system are taking care about CPU, memory, network bandwidth, flash space, you call it. There will be different uh, resources that are constrained, that are limited, and we need to take care about them. Having great applications, running in a PC, fulfilling all the interfaces, bearing the fruits that we talked about, having the necessary functionality, is not enough if they need to run in an embedded device with limited resources, and in the end, it turns out, that they use, for example, too much CPU. There are two applications and both of them wanted to use more than half. The in the end, the system will not work. When it was running in different environment, in the PC, it was fine. When it's running in target environment, it's not. They are not coexisting together in harmony. They were when there was abundance of resources, but when they are exposed to their target environment, they unfortunately fight with one another to get some. Therefore, be sure that you take care about resources when talking about compatibility. Somehow we will see soon what to do about it. Right now, remember these three things. The compatibility is about interfaces, functionality, and resources where these pieces will be running in. And so far, we didn't yet touch time. And time is what makes this compatibility play a lot more interesting because when we are working here and now on these two parts it's a little bit easy but if we need to replace some part we are entering the area of backward and forward compatibility and backward and forward compatibility is where the fun begins we will have some components and for some reason, these components will get replaced over time. They might get obsolete. There might be inherent security issues in them. There will be a reason why we need to replace one of them. We have one that stays and one that gets replaced. Here on a screen, you can see teal and gray component. The gray one needs to be replaced. What we are left is one device that stays there. We cannot change it. It will be the, the customer or the users want it to stay there. They are used to it, they like the functionality, they like how it operates, and they want to keep it as it is. They don't want to invest in it. The other one, unfortunately, needs to go. And now we need to provide some replacement for it. First, we'll try to build something that is backward compatible. So we have that old device, we put it aside somewhere there, it's in the past, and we are building something new and shiny here. But that new and shiny thing is constrained by, by what this old part could have done, by what this old part could have achieved. 
this new part needs to handle all signals that were intended for the old part and respond to them in the same way as the old part would respond. So it must mimic in some way the functionality, the responses of the old one. We can say that they are indistinguishable from the perspective of the part that stays. So we use that old device as some kind of stencil. Or on the other side, we can look from the perspective of this part that doesn't change and we want these interfaces toward the new device to stay as they are and this is our stencil. We can reverse engineer what is on this side and somehow fulfill it from that side. So you can look at it at the dual perspective. Either we are building something that is a drop-in replacement for this old part that is interpreting all the signals meant for it in the same way or we are building something that matches the interface of the guy that stays. What is beautiful here is that that part cannot change, but it's only a subset of functions that this new device can provide. It doesn't have to be exact copy. It might provide something new. For example, if you had that old device and it was old, it does only have some command line interface for operator to configure it, and we want to add something new and shiny that allows us to operate that device over web browser, we can do so, no problem, as long as all signals meant for all device are handled the same ways. And signals can be anything. It can be configuration file, it can be message, whatever you think about, that's the signal, that's the input for that old device. If the CLI was there, operators are used to it, that CLI itself is also some kind of signals. But we can extend it, we can build on top, we can add new functionalities. If the old one, didn't support an encryption and transport layer, well, the new one must support that mode as well, but it can add it on top. And this is great about backward compatible devices because they can renew the world. Now, the problem starts when the story changes. Someone comes to us and asks us, please, we need to replace that device, give us the new one, the old one stays, but there is one catch. I have, I don't know, one million of these devices there. There is no way I will replace all of them over one night. So I will be running mixture of old devices and new devices in my network, in my system, whatever it is, for weeks, maybe months. And, you know, it will be problematic for my people to distinguish between them because there will be a team of people who wants to replace these devices overnight and they don't know will they replace whole city today, half city, there might be issues, uh, they might not be allowed into the building, so they don't know what they will replace. On the other hand, I have different team of people who are configuring th these devices and I don't want them to chase the other team and learn each and every change in the system. So I want these devices to be configured in the same way. So if I am producing a configuration file for the new device, I want it to be accepted by the old device. And one more catch, since I am already paying you for this new thing, I want to use its features. So please let me enable them, let me configure them in that configuration file. So now, do you see what happened? We need to somehow make sure that the old device is accepting inputs that were meant for the new device. There is configuration file, it will have configuration meant for the new device, but the old one will be exposed to it and must handle it gracefully. It might not know what to do about these new configuration fields, of course they are not meant for it, but it needs to handle them gracefully. And when it comes to this configuration file, it might be tempting when you are building the very first application to think about configuration file and operator who is actually configuring that site. And you might have this stream of thoughts. All right, so somebody will be configuring my device. So that person will enter the keys there. He will upload it to the device. And that person wants to learn about any issues with the configuration file. Of course, I need to give them means to learn that there is, for example, typo, or they used some key that I don't know how to handle, or a value is out of the range that I can support. So I need to give them feedback. And I will be strict about it. 
I will make it an error, I will reject that configuration so that person immediately knows this configuration file was wrong, there is a list of issues that I figured out, I tell the person what to change, and if he changes it, I will accept the file. And this is variable strategy. It will help the person to configure that device properly. The problem is, if we want forward compatibility, this totally ruins it. No matter what we do about this new device, we cannot add any new keys, because old device will always reject configuration file. But you can have different stream of thoughts. You can think, well, I have this configuration file, I need to let the person know if there are errors or fields that I somehow cannot accept, but wait, if the necessary configuration is there, I can still accept it, if that minimum set is fulfilled, but still I will issue a warning. I will tell person that, okay, I am accepting that file because it's fine, I can work with it, but there is tiny issue that this, 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 and this field, I have no idea what to do about it, I'm doing nothing about it, but feel free to fix it, but I will work with what I got from you. And this tiny difference in what you thought back then changes how you feel about building new device today. Either you have or you don't have forward compatibility. This is this plan part. Think about it and make sure that you identify potential changes in the future and enable them. You do not have to anticipate what will change. You do not need to figure out that there will be TLS. The standards might not be yet there even in the brains of people who will invent them in future. Just let people extend the configuration file and they will know how to handle this future standards when the times come. Another example when it comes to compatibility, a uh, very prominent one, is software management. When you are working on embedded devices like routers, switches, etc., there, there is some software running there. And you might have, for example, two partitions, one having active software and one having passive software to have some kind of failover mechanism. That software is broken, oh, okay, I will fail over, I will switch back to the old one that was working fine. And now, this doesn't happen often, but it might happen that we need to, for example, change the file system. It might have been discovered that for some reason the file system that was used with that particular flash unfortunately wears it out too early. And we are basically endangering our hardware. We need to replace it. This isn't something that we do every time and we might not have embedded that functionality in the old software. And now if we have forward compatibility or we don't, we'll change the game. If we don't have forward compatibility, what we can do is that, well, we can, for example, load some kind of intermediate software and that intermediate software will do formatting, changing the file system and only then upload new versions. So we are switching to software versions at once. But this erases our failsafe partition. So we have no safe software to go back. Or we can do it over several releases of that software, several versions. We have software that doesn't have that functionality, we introduce software that has that functionality but cannot yet format anything, and only then, after next upgrade, we can have it. This will work, but this will prolong it and expose flashes to longer period of time when invalid file system is in use. What we could have done when we were designing the software management, we didn't have I an idea that we will be changing file system, for what reason? But what we could have done, we could have thought, well, this is a complex procedure, we cannot predict what can change in future, and we will enable the future user to somehow inject some kind of compatibility script. So when I will be uploading new software, before I reboot with the new version, I will check if there is some kind of compatibility script inside. I will define the interface, how it's called, what it is, of course. I will not know what's inside, but I will just run it in my current environment. And if we have that functionality, then we are golden. We just upload software image, that software image has that compatibility script and what it does is reformats that partition where it was uploaded, of course making sure that it's not paged out and then uploads the target software again to already reformatted partition. Having forward compatibility changes games. This doesn't happen very often, 
This is not your usual daily bread, but when it comes to that, it will save your tears, it will save your sweat. And what is beautiful about forward compatibility is that usually when we don't need it, we are not forced to use it. We will leave these options, we will enable someone to add new configuration file keys or to have this compatibility script, but we don't have to use them. We do not have to add new fields with every configuration file version. We do not need to have compatibility script in all versions or all it does is just exits with no error. But when the times come and we want to go full ahead and use these functionalities, they might save a lot of trouble. So compatibility is about things working together, bearing some fruits we can reap, and things that mix well, that are working together in harmony, where we cannot distinguish the parts. We have this printer, we have that computer, and they are forming perfect black box printing station. Now we will continue with tools related to compatibility. We have different ones and first of all I would like you to remember tools are just tools and an example of that might be mounting a TV on a wall. I will need TV, I will need some kind of drill, some screws and obviously TV and mount. I will have my wall and if I have power tool, power drill, then it will be quite easy task. If I don't have, I need to do it manually, that will be a little bit cumbersome and tedious. So the tool will change my life, it will make it easier. But if I don't take care about compatibility of TV and wall, this is the end result. This wall wasn't able to lift that much wave. And obviously it wasn't the fault of the tool. The drill was just a drill. It was me who didn't check if that TV can be lifted by that wall. There wasn't compatibility between them. The tool couldn't have resolved it. And the same is about libraries meant for interfaces, libraries meant to define your functionality. They will not resolve all compatibility issues, but they will make your life easier. So use them, select the one that fits you, just don't trust that it takes away all work from you. You still need to account for compatibility, but it will be easier for you. What these tools will offer? First of all, Thermosity. What we see right now on the screen is some kind of configuration file. And already from that description, it's JSON, so it's self-descriptive language. So we can guess what this file was meant to, to do. There is some TLS enabled, the value is false, so obviously this is some kind of flag to enable or disable a feature. There is some kind of description, it's a string, so we can somehow guess what it does. There is port, well, that's some kind of number that will be probably used to establish socket. And an IP, probably to bind, given as a string. Already just using this format gives us some information about it, but we have right now no idea. Is it really correct? Was it what it was what was it what was meant for that file? And some kind of tool, some kind of schema will make it easier. I have chosen JSON schema for examples, but you could have used something different. I have chosen JSON schema because it's self-descriptive and it will be easy to explain. If we add some schema to that example, we can clearly see there was an error. The TLS enabled should have been actually enabled TLS. We have written down that contract of ours, we have written down what we actually meant. We can now cross-check the actual configuration file against the schema and figure out if there are errors. We we'll figure out what was intended and what is an error. We have that contract, we have something to follow. This is a very simple example, we can extend it, we can add even more. So we had types, now what we are adding here is default values and also this required part. This required part is telling us what fields must be there necessarily. If they are not there, file will be rejected. If they are there and the others are missing, it's fine. So we can extend this file in future and also we do not require everyone to configure each and every parameter, making the life of person configuring that system a little bit easier. And this itself is already a lot. We have contract written down, we can spice it up, 
by adding validation. When we embed in that schema validation, we can tell that, okay, this part, it's some kind of an integer, but it cannot take any value. The value must be in a range from 1024 to over 65,000. And this is the range from here to there. Something outside of it will be rejected. And this also constrains our application and offloads our application from checking this manually. But on the other hand, it tells somebody who is using it automatically that this is what you can expect. If you configure something outside of it, you will not get what you intended. This is very good because they learn about it already from the schema itself. They do not need to learn about these constraints by running the application, checking out and figuring out it doesn't work and then running again with different set of parameters and counting for a miracle to happen. Similarly, for these IPs, now we can be sure that this application supports both IPv4 and IPv6. Without that addition, it wasn't that easy. We had this IP in IPv4 format, but was it meant to be IPv4? Could it have accepted IPv6? Now we know it. Another great thing about this validation is that it's portable. We are using some kind of meta language and that meta language, well, it's independent from the application and technology we are building the application with. JSON schema offers validator implementation for multiple different languages. This, the same will be true for different solutions. Google protocol buffers, flood buffers, carbon proto, select what you like. It will give you some tools, some means to port it. So now when you are working on a system that consists of few different applications or devices, one written in C++, some front-end in PHP, some kind of uh, Python scripts, whatever it is, you take that schema, the contract that you wrote once, you generate validators for each one of them and they all behave the same. You are free from the burden of handcrafting that code and you are sure that there are no additional errors. It makes your life easier? I guess it does. But then these tools won't cover everything. The tools have no idea what are your constraints. They will not know if you can add the CPUs or you cannot, or if you should accept all the fields or the keys in the configuration file or you should reject them. It's up to you to configure it and to keep in mind what constraints you have and what constraints you want to impose. And when you build these interfaces and you know already what the contract is and you need to build another compatible device, the tool itself, it will not use for our compatibility. You are the one who needs to write this compatibility script. You are the one who needs to extend that schema in a way that next version will be compatible with it. The same about backward compatibility. You can make an error. You can remove fields from JSON schema. If you do so, obviously the new device won't be compatible with the old one. Remember, compa backward compatibility is about new device interpreting and accepting and properly responding to all the signals, all the messages, configuration data that was meant for the old device. If you remove something that was intended to be there, like this IP port or IPv6, then the old device would accept that IPv6 format and the new one won't. That's not backward compatible. And the JSON schema wouldn't save you from that or any other tool for that matter. It's you who needs to make sure that you are following the rules. And this kind of tools won't cover errors. We can have perfect schema. We can have perfect description. We have this required fields IP and port and description is not required. But if we write code like this in an application, then by no means it will work. If we check on purpose, if description was set and we throw an error then, and that error is nowhere caught, then we are in trouble. And it's not due to tool, it's due to our application layer. The tool itself is not aware of what we write in application layer. It will not know what kind of solutions we have there. It will not know what is the stack of network protocols. We need to make these decisions and we need to follow rules. We cannot 
override what is in contract. We have the contract and we need to obey it. That's it. And last but not least is functionality and performance. Since the tool itself doesn't know anything about application, it cannot know anything about functionality that application needs to provide or performance. For the tool, it's tabula rasa. It's empty sheet of paper. We cannot predict what it is. The author of the tool could have put a lot of effort to make that kind of a library lightweight, for example, so that it fits embedded devices. But in the end, this is your budget, and you know if that tool is okay for that budget or not, and your application will probably take a lot more of the overall budget of the device where it's supposed to be running than the library itself. And the library will not help you. You will be the one taking care about functionality and performance here. So knowing that all, and knowing that the tool will not free you of all things that you need to take care about, well, we need to learn some rules and use our imagination. What will be these rules? Well, there are five principles that always come in handy. And if you guessed, I'm going to tell you about solid. You are right, I'm going to tell you about solid. Every time you meet computer problem, you sooner or later learn about solid principles. And they have very good use in compatibility as well. So, first of all, we have single responsibility principle. Single responsibility principle tells us that there is one and only one reason for this thing to change. I shouldn't be changing it for different reasons. It should do one thing, do it right. If I need to change in that system, there is only one reason why I need to change that very part. If we follow single responsibility principle, compatibility becomes simple because even when we need to replace that thing, it's small. It has that one responsibility, it has that one reason for change, and I am changing only that one small part. And if I didn't follow it, if I build two huge GAT objects with multiple responsibilities, now if that one device needs to go, it's obsolete, I need to recreate all that value, all that inter terminate all that interfaces, recreate all the functionality and build new budgets for each and every part that was inside. W I need to take care about multiple responsibilities. Following that rule will make your life easier because you will be able to replace small parts. And even if you have two physical devices, the way you create, the way you design the software that runs on the devices will allow you to reuse some parts from the old device. If the error that rendered that old device obsolete was, for example, lack of, I don't know, encryption on uh, transport layer, then we can salvage almost whole application layer if, if we have one component that takes care about the uh, encryption and transport. Or if the issue was just the hardware, I can reuse the components that can be ported. Following single responsibility principle, first of all, limits the amount of work we need to redo when it comes to building a compatible device and it allows us to reuse the work that we did in the past. Then we have open-closed principle. Open for extensions, closed for modifications. And if you see here analogy to forward compatibility, that's exactly it. Open for extensions, closed for the modifications. This old device that we we're talking about, it's totally closed for any modifications. It's there, it's deployed, it cannot be changed. It was built 100 years ago, it runs on coal and steam, Nobody knows how to even operate it. People who built it retired already a long time ago. Nobody can help you modify that device. But it's open for extension. It can accept these new configuration fields. It can accept this configuration script or compatibility script, whatever it is. It's, it was built with that principle in mind and now it can ease your life today when you are bringing new version by providing you forward compatibility. Open closed principle today gives you what is needed to have forward compatibility tomorrow. Next, we have list of substitution principle and that principle 
tells us that when we are creating a class that is derived of some base, then that derived class must obey the full contract of the base class. It must accept the same arguments, it must produce the same values, it cannot shrink ranges. For every property that old class had, the base class had, the derived class must also have that property. This is basically the definition of backward compatibility put in different words. The old device, the new device, and the new device being the derived one must have all properties of the old device. Lisk of substitution principle will tell you how to achieve the backward compatibility. Then we have interface segregation. Interface segregation tells us that if we have multiple functionalities, we should have separate interfaces for different functionalities, for different responsibilities. And now it plays very nice with the single responsibility principle. We, first of all, create small things that have only one reason for change. Then we segregate our interfaces into different functionalities so that minimal piece needs to terminate minimal set of these interfaces. When we are rebuilding it from scratch for some reason or when we are updating it, we are, by following these two rules, minimizing the amount of work to do, minimizing the impact, minimizing the risks. We don't need to go through each and every message inside of the system. We have segregated interfaces, we have single responsibilities, we know what this part does, and now it is pleasure to work with it. We don't need to reverse engineer what the old one did because its uh, interfaces are defined formally, the interfaces are segregated, the functionality is well defined, and there is single responsibility, the amount of work is limited, and the context of work is well set. And last but not least is dependency inversion. So we have these two devices today, and let's imagine that this device will be configuring the whole network. There will be some kind of an element manager, some kind of web browser UI for it, and it will be passing configuration to this device. So natural flow of information is web element manager, this device, and then that device. In theory, we could have done interfaces so that they follow the same way. I web element manager defines interface here, this one defines interface for this one. Dependency inversion allows us to change that direction. And here we can think about it, what part is more likely to, to change in future? What is more likely to have a reason to change? I have two devices and they might have different functionalities. They will have different functionalities and some of them will be exposed to change for some reason. It might happen that the one that is terminating user interface is for some reason more likely to change. And then when we already know that this is the one that is supposed to change more often, we build our interfaces so that the stable one dictates how they should behave. This one is the one who defines, who exposes the interfaces. And then, no matter what happens on that side, we can have plethora of different solutions here, delivered by different vendors. This guy is telling what the interface should be. There won't be any discussion how to interpret these messages because this site is stable, it didn't change, it went nowhere, and if it worked with the first incarnation, it shall work with second one. If it doesn't, we can clearly say that this new incarnation is where default is. Imagine what happens when we don't do that. It is this site that is defining the interface. And now this guy works, this guy doesn't, but they are the one defining interface and they will be trying to tell this guy who didn't change that he is uh, making some mistake. This would be tedious. You can protect yourself by inversing the dependencies by thinking who is more likely to change and then making the owner of the interface the one who is supposed to be more stable. We won't go into all details about solid principles here. I truly encourage you to learn them, to find materials about them. There will be a lot that you will learn from that journey. 
but it doesn't end here. We have some principles when it comes to defining our interfaces, but then the principles are one thing. There is also functionality to take care about. And when it comes to functionality, we have our system, right? It's composed of multiple pieces, but they should create this homogeneous mixture. We shouldn't be able to tell all the parts apart. And now what I truly encourage you to do is to have the black box test suite that encompasses this whole system. Let it be this printing station. So there is a printer, there is some PC, there is some screen, but I don't want to look inside it. I want to see printing station. I click the button here, I see something here, there is a printout, but it's one homogeneous system. And I want this one homogeneous system to be covered with black box test suite. That black box test suite, all it does is make sure that it presses that button, makes sure that it takes that printout and it looks there, it compares it and it's fine. And why am I insisting that it's a black box test suite on that high level? First of all, if we build test cases only for different pieces, we never know if they will work together well. It might happen that this one works well in isolation, this one works well in isolation, but together they don't work. What I am saying here is that you need to test on the highest level, test everything together. Test the smaller parts too, test them, have unit test cases as well. This will give you information if what you intended is what you really did, but in the end, test whole thing together as well. Do not skip it. It might be tempting if you know what it should do, it's enough, but then in the end, what you are providing to someone, what really produces these fruits that we we're talking about, is this whole system, test it as a whole. Imagine if we are talking about cell phones, the cell phones are changing each and every day. Every day we have some new releases of cell phones or new uh, announcement of cell phones, and they need to be compatible with the base station, of course. And, well, we can't build the cell phone on its own, but in the end, that cell phone must cooperate with that base station. Have some test cases. I'm not saying you have to have a lot of them, but have some test cases that will test that cell phone with that PTS, make sure that it works together, that it truly produces the homogeneous system. As we know it, most of people are not aware that there are some base stations. That's how well it works. The system is truly homogeneous thanks to the extensive black box testing. And then we have performance. And what we can do about performance? First of all, performance is about meeting some limits. We have some CPU, some memory, some flash, some bandwidth that we need to respect. And well, I have only that much CPU cycles I can use. I have only that much memory I can use. I can define budget. Some part will be taken by operating system. Let's give it 30%. Some part will be left for spare, that will be our reserve for new features in future, for example, or for errors, let it be 20%. What is left, I give to specific applications. The first time I do it, I have no idea what applications I will have there. So assume something. You have two or more applications, let's assume we have two, and you can think about functionalities these applications need to provide. You can think what they will be doing. Will it be memory intensive operations? Or maybe there will be a lot of computation in this one. And you can somehow figure out, this will get 40% memory, this will get 60% of remaining memory. This will get 75% um, of CPU because it's really computation expensive. This one gets remaining 25. Make some budget. When you have that budget, well, measure. First of all, ideally you measure in the target device. If it's embedded device, you measure in the embedded device. If it's cloud, you measure in cloud. But at this stage, it's not that important yet. You can find out your platform of choice, the one you feel confident with, and start there. Make sure it's easy for you. It should be pleasure to measure these things. If it's your PC, fine. It doesn't matter at this stage yet that this whole thing needs to run on totally different CPU. You have x86, fine. It needs to run on MIPS, 
there will be time for MIPS. Right now, measure it, op and then when you figure out it doesn't meet the budgets, and probably it won't, optimize. When you optimize, do not go too deep. Figure out what was the bottleneck. If you could have identified two or three bottlenecks, address them, but do not try to do too much. Optimize the thing that you see is the burning issue and then repeat. If you don't have to change budget and if you found room for optimization, you don't need to change budgets yet, go to measurement directly. You will get a new report, you will figure out new bottlenecks, you will optimize it. Repeat, repeat. If you get it, meet the budget, now it's time to go to the target environment. Measuring target environment, optimize, repeat. If you figure out that with this budget it cannot be met, or you see that you made some wrong assumption, that heavy computation that you thought will be there is not there, but actually in the other part, well, move that budget, change it. But that should be the last resort. First of all, identify bottlenecks, then optimize few of them, do not go too deep, optimize the top ones, remeasure, repeat. If it comes to that, you have no way to go, there is no optimization option anymore, you are clueless, then you can touch the budgets. But the recipe is simple. Define budget, measure, optimize, repeat, measure, optimize, repeat, go to target, measure, optimize, repeat, and you will get your intended results. And you will have plenty of presentations related to measurements and optimization. If you are interested in the topic, I can refer you to my presentation from last year when I was talking about CPU caches and where you will learn some tricky things about how to optimize latency of computer system. And thank you very much for attention. I would like to highlight what is the clue of that presentation. The compatibility is about few things, at least two, working together, bearing some fruits that we can reap, producing some value, and making one black box system that is homogeneous where the parts doesn't separate. That will come with some work. We will need planning and there are no freebies. There is no one tool or one solution that will give us all the answers. We will take care about it. We will be the ones accountable for the end result, but we have some tools and we have some rules and we have our creative mind to follow the rules, to predict the future that will help us on that journey. Thank you very much again for your attention. I'm Kamil Vitecki. This year, the presentation is delivered to you via stream. You can ask me face to face a question, but if you have something that bothers you, that bugs you, or you would like to go deeper, I encourage you to contact me on my email address that is right now on the bottom of the screen. Thank you very much again. Goodbye and have a good day, everyone. Thanks very much, Camu. Thank you very much for your insights, great insights on compatibility. Uh, thank you again. And well, this is Code Dive. Don't go away. Uh, our next presentation is coming up shortly. Stay with us.
Hello, welcome back. You're watching Code Dive, and well, it's time for our next speaker, and our next speaker is Agata Migalska. Now, Agata is a uh, data scientist with a strong background in computer science research and software engineering. She currently works at Nokia and applies statistical and machine learning methods to support business processes. In the past, she worked on large enterprise systems, e-commerce solutions, image processing, optimization, and human-computer interaction. Now, on the side, Agata has been contributing to a international research um, project that is focused on the modeling on the coronavirus spread. So, Agata, thank you very much for this contribution. And, well, yes, talk to us about your supply chain profitability. Thank you for this lovely introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about cloud business solution, increasing supply chain profitability. So, you already know a little bit about myself. I'm a, from my background, I'm a computer scientist. I've been working quite a long time in software engineering. And also, as was said, uh, I'm contributing in my free time to the uh, modeling of the coronavirus spread research. Um, today we're going to talk about this uh, supply chain and optimization within it. And uh, so first I will present to you the motivation and the problem. Uh, then uh, we'll go into the solutions uh, that can be applied to these kind of problems. And that calls upon um, reminding you what a prescriptive analytics is and what optimization is about. Uh, then we'll get into the optimization engine itself, like how it was implemented and what kind of problems it can solve. Uh, then uh, the second part of the presentation is going to be focused on embedding the solution in a cloud. And that will also reveal some challenges that we faced when doing uh, this uh, embedding. So that will be covered in the automation part. And finally, I will summarize my presentation. Uh, so, in a nutshell, the presentation is going to be uh, from the problem through the algorithm that was developed uh, to the whole infrastructure in which this algorithm was embedded. So, this is the, the general overview of what I will be presenting to you today. <coughs> okay, let's start with a motivation and a problem statement. Uh, so, uh, from time to time, uh, the component market is uh, observing some sort of component shortages. So uh, all the companies that are within the electronic market are suffering due to this component shortage. And um, the component shortage can arise uh, for two reasons. It's either due to the um, uh, ri <laughs> abrupt rise in, uh, in demand, or on the other hand, uh, it can be a sudden drop in supply. And uh, the reason why the companies suffer from this uh, component shortage is uh, that uh, they actually uh, cannot provide enough uh, products to their customers. And so it is uh, uh, connected to the risk of missing their revenue or um, um, terms and conditions that uh, inquire some uh, penalties. And um, mm uh, at Nokia, we noticed that the tools that were available in the market, the commercial uh, tools, are not sufficient to give us uh, enough power or possibilities uh, to uh, perform the systematic and analytical optimization process of uh, this uh, components allocation in a situation of a component shortage. And also what was noticed that there is a limited possibi possibility provided by these tools to simulate the situation when you don't get the components from your suppliers, but these components are available in a market. So you can just go and kind of purchase like you would go in a, to the shop and, uh, and uh, buy these components. And there was no way to decide whether this kind of decision pays off. And the solution that we proposed is the uh, optimization uh, program, uh, which is actually integer linear optimization program, that is allowing for systematic allocation of such components to products and then to customers. As a side effect or side benefit of a solution that we pro pr provided 
is that we al integrated the data coming from various sources, from, from the supply, from demand, uh, from commercial, meaning prices and terms and conditions. And it was already giving our stakeholders an overview of the supply chain uh, process. To, to give you an idea how big the supply chain um, optimization problem is, uh, here uh, is a, a diagram that um, basically explains it. Uh, these numbers are arbitrary, uh, but uh, what we have is the there are some uh, there's some number of suppliers who are producing or delivering some components to our factories. These factories are then in turn uh, manufacturing or assembling sales items. Sales item is a product, this is an equivalent. And these sales items are then delivered to the customers. And if we just look at the numbers uh, here, uh, that gives us quite a lot of combinations. So imagine that there is some component missing and uh, now decide which factory does not get these components to assemble products, decide which products do not get produced, and decide which customers do not get their products. Uh, so this is basically beyond human capability to um, solve this problem by hand, and this is the reason why we need more advanced analytical tools. And that way, let us go into business analytics and uh, specifically into prescriptive analytics. So business analytics is about uh, designing models and uh, simulations uh, that uh, uh, allow to create scenarios, uh, understand reality and predict uh, the future. What is important about um, these tools is that they are not only um, they are not only models. These models are put into a larger software that is able to produce insights that is uh, embedded in applications and is then generating some outcomes that can be used by business stakeholders. And uh, within business analytics, we can distinguish three building blocks. First of all, we have uh, descriptive analytics, which allows us to answer the question, what happened and why did it happen? So basically, we get some insights from historical data. Secondly, uh, we can have predictive analytics. So we can predict what will happen. And uh, so it gives us some future estimates. And finally, uh, we have uh, prescriptive analytics, uh, which answers the question, what shall we do to achieve certain goal, to make something happen? And so this is a decision a recommendation that we are obtaining out of this process. Uh, so what we are going to talk about today is basically about decision support systems. And there is quite a few ways to approach decision making. So first of all, you can have an expert system. An expert system is basically when you put the all the expert knowledge in kind of a box and then when you're dealing with a problem that is applicable to this expert, uh, you just kind of write it down and ask the, this expert system to give you the recommendation, what shall you do? And uh, this is one of the oldest approaches to, to artificial intelligence and for the intelligent decision making. And uh, it was um, motivated by the fact that expert knowledge was, uh, there were not many experts, so the knowledge was scarce and there was a um, huge demand for this kind of knowledge. Then we have fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is a uh, system where you, um, well, is it hot or cold today? Ah, it's kind of hot. So fuzzy logic captures all this kind of. Uh, so it has all these flavors of uncertainty that we humans express. And then we have, uh, multi-agent systems and mi micro simulations. And uh, these are very interesting systems because, well, you have a, a bunch of agents. Each agent is a rational individual. So it has uh, some rules implemented or some uh, general logic uh, to towards its behavior implemented. And then you just put the whole society of such agents in some circumstances and you observe how they interact and what is the outcome of this interaction. So basically, you can apply certain changes to the environment and then see what is the outcome uh, over time. 
So multi-agent systems are great for observing how the society will evolve. And, um, uh, and one very interesting uh, system, al although it is not uh, directly connected to decision support, uh, is Massive. Massive uh, was developed for Lord of the Rings in early 2000, years 2000. And uh, basically each warrior is, a, is an intelligent agent that uh, is governed by these fuzzy logic principles. And uh, then I uh, you have a whole battlefield of these agents and uh, you can observe some, uh, well, basically rational behaviors like somebody fleeing from the battlefield and other interactions of these warriors. Um, then let's <laughs> jump back into decision support systems from this massive. And uh, so here another way to approach it is a uh, artificial neural network. And uh, so basically you have some sort of black box where you put some inputs and you get the output as a decision. You might not understand why this decision was taken, but apparently it's an optimal decision. Uh, further, we have reinforcement learning. And uh, so here we want to know the sequence of actions that we should perform in order to achieve certain goals. So a reinforcement learning is uh, mm, currently um, very much uh, used for playing games. So you want to win a game and then you need to make certain steps to actually win it. And finally, we have optimization. And this is going to be something that I'm going to talk about today. And optimization is actually not a new concept. It was developed in the 50s of the previous century. And um, uh, for that reason, it is maybe not the sexiest as the neural networks are at the moment. But on the other hand, there is still an ongoing research into um, providing new techniques for uh, optimization. There is a lot of research towards using GPU for optimization and so on. And also due to the capacity of our um, computers, the optimization, the size of the optimization problems we can solve is getting bigger and bigger. Okay, so I discussed these uh, optimization problems uh, and the decision support systems for a while now. We know that we are going to talk about optimization, so let us have a feeling for it. So for instance, an example optimization problem might be that you are going on a two-week quarantine and you want to buy enough food uh, to be able to compose diversified meals because you don't want to eat spaghetti every single day. And uh, so you want some sort of composable meals and then you also don't want to exceed the budget. So in principle you have some food items, let's call them food items for no better word. and they need to be composable into meals and uh, you have these two constraints of the money and the time. So in, op uh, in optimization we always need to um, describe three things. One is an objective function, so what it is that we want to optimize. So in this case we want to maximize th the diversity of our meals. And secondly we have some decision variables, so something that we can change. Uh, so uh, here we have a quantity of these food uh, items, or actually quantity of each food item. So if you make a list of all the food items that there are in a supermarket, you kind of can assign the quantity of each of them that you want to purchase. And finally, we have uh, constraints. Uh, these constraints are in this case that we don't want to exceed the, f the budget that we have for the food. Uh, we want to make a be able to make at least uh, the, num sorry, the number of meals that we want to make uh, should be enough for two weeks. And uh, also these food items that we buy must be composable into meals. So this is one simple example that you might be um, uh, dealing with uh, on an everyday basis. You might be saying that, oh, I'm not going on a quarantine anytime soon. At least I don't, I don't I hope I'm not going on a quarantine anytime soon. But then if you think of a kind of normal life that we used to have a year ago, um, you might have been going to work from Monday to Friday and then on Saturday doing the shopping for the whole week. And this is basically a very similar problem. Another problem that you might be facing in your everyday life uh, is uh, about routing. 
So basically, you, you want to go from point uh, A to point B and visit some places on, on, your, on your path, on your route. So you're starting with a dot here at the top, and you want to get home, which is on a, um, on a right. And then on your way, you want to visit a cafe, a bank, and a shopping center. Uh, and now the question is, which path is optimal if you want to have a fastest route? So like, in what sequence shall you go to these points to get the fastest route? And so again, if we want to express it in, in uh, these three uh, elements that are important for optimization, first of all, we want to have an objective that we want to maximize the time spent, uh, uh, minimize, sorry, time spent commuting. Uh, second of all, we have these variables. First of all, the sequence of stop points. And uh, second of all, we might want to use different means of transport. So we might also want to consider that. And the constraint is that each point uh, is should be visited exactly once. Uh, so now I believe you have a pretty good understanding of what optimization problems are about. And so let's dive into the optimization engine that we pr proposed in, in our solution. So going back into supply chain, we have these suppliers, we have products, and we have customers. Customers give us a demand for the products. And so now the whole thing about the problem that we are dealing with in here is to answer simultaneously two questions. How to allocate components to products and at the same time how to allocate products to customers. And remember we are facing the situation when there is a component shortage. So we don't have enough components to produce all products and satisfy all the customers. We need to harm somebody and the decision here is about whom. And uh, let's now jump into the uh, definition of a problem. There's going to be some math, but don't get scared. It's just a little bit and uh, it will be well explained. Uh, so first of all, we start with input variables and uh, there is uh, first of all, bill of material. This is basically like a recipe for how many components you need to take of each type of a component to assemble a product. Uh, then we have a component supply, so what we get from our suppliers. We have a demand for products from customers. We have capacities of factories because, well, it's not infinite and also sometimes factories are going for some downtime to uh, maintain and uh, check their uh, production lines. Uh, further, we have products interdependencies. What's that? Um, this is when, when the customer is ordering certain products um, and there's one order and, for example, three products, they want these products to be delivered together. And uh, so it doesn't make sense for them to get only one item out of that. Uh, they want all together. So these are these inter interdependencies. These are basically given by the order. And uh, finally, we have a uh, um, net unit price of each product. So how much do our customers pay for each product? Further, we have decision variables. And the most important decision variable here is why we need the fulfilled demand. So how much demand out of this customer's demand did we manage to fulfill? Uh, we have a complementary variable being a complement of this why, and this is unsatisfied demand. So we, are, we need to keep track of both. And uh, finally, we have X, and this is the number of components that we used uh, to manufacture these products uh, that, uh, that are manufactured in Y. So X is kind of very much dependent on Y, and you can see Y as the only decision variable. X is given by the bill of material multiplied by Y, but for the sake of um, mm, ease of use, we, uh, we are keeping track of all these variables. And uh, the objective we have has is to maximize the revenue. So basically the revenue is a uh, number of uh, items, number of products multiplied by their price. And we do it for every product and every customer. <coughs> Further, we have some constraints. So we cannot use more components that we have uh, supplied from the our suppliers. Uh, then we cannot we, well, we are not really interested in uh, exceeding the demand. Uh, so this is also a constraint that we don't want 
this to be exceeded. Uh, further, we want this satisfied and unsatisfied demand together to be um, very close to the demand from our customers. So actually, this is uh, uh, the, the level um, of demand that we want to control. Uh, further, we cannot exceed the factory's capacity, so this is also captured. And we want to maintain these interdependencies, so that's captured as well. And finally, we have uh, non-negativity of our variables, because it doesn't make sense to produce the negative number of products, as well as it doesn't make sense to use the negative number of, uh, of components. Um, also, which comes from integer linear programming problem, uh, we have these variables integer. And at this point I should explain to you what is integer linear programming problem. <laughs> so, as I said, uh, the these variables are integer. So, integer corresponds to the decision variable. And, well, again, it doesn't make sense to buy 7.2 capacitor or 2.7 resistor. No, not really. These are integer numbers. So, we can buy 7 capacitors, 2 resistors or some other number, but it needs to be integer. Uh, so, this is where integer goes. Now, linear. Linear corresponds to the objective function. And so, well, it they basically means that our objective function is either a line in two dimensions or a surface in three dimensions on an n-dimensional equivalent of, of a line in n dimensions, if we happen to have n, uh, n variables. And programming is the most confusing, because programming is a synonym of uh, optimization problem. Programming was used in this context in the 50s of the previous century, uh, when the programming uh, as we know today, meaning programming languages and uh, software engineering, this didn't exist yet. And so, uh, to the person who coined this term, uh, optimization problem seemed like a program, like you give the things like variables, objective, constraints, seemed like a program, and so the, the term was coined, and it survives until survived until today, and is still used. But uh, it means no more than optimization problem. Okay, so that was the formal definition of a uh, optimization engine that uh, um, is the key of uh, of a presentation today. Let us now look at some examples. So we are dealing with some key uh, toy example uh, where we have um, several products, several components, and uh, several customers. So it's like um, nine, eight, and uh, twenty of each. At the in a at the bottom chart, we have um, demand for each of the products, and so you can see how that varies in time because we are covering here twelve periods, uh, th twelve time periods. And so, the use cases in which the optimization framework that we developed can be used are, first of all, um, open market purchase recommendations. So, this is something that I mentioned already. When you can buy um, components in an open market, uh, but you don't know whether it pays off. So, um, this is where we can make this kind of recommendation whether to go with such a purchase or not. Uh, the second use case is benchmarking strategic factors. So, for maybe for some reason you want to, or your company wants to um, focus on a certain market because it's strategically very important. Like, no matter how much it costs, you just want them to be happy because you want your company to grow in this particular region or to monopolize this region. And uh, that comes usually at a price. It's usually not optimal in case of uh, component shortage, but the question here is how much does it cost? Okay, so let's look into these uh, use cases in more details. Uh, so first of all, the use case of open purchase, open market purchase recommendation. Um, and so here we have uh, the situation. In a top uh, chart, we have um, mm, we have a situation with components. So as long as it's yellow, is good. But as soon as it gets uh, more diverse colors, we can see that there is a shortage of this particular component. So here we are missing three components. This 
Three components are actually contributed to four products and are purchased or ordered by several customers. And uh, what we want to do is to assess whether buying any of these uh, components in an open market uh, is worth it. And so we are considering the open market purchase at 20 times the median wholesale price, so 20 times more than we would pay to our regular suppliers. And uh, now the stakeholders might be asking, will buying component 8 alone increase the production output? Or they might be asking, will buying component 2 and component 4 together will increase the production output? And uh, let's consider the case of uh, component 8 alone only. So here in the charts we are looking at the quantities that are being manufactured and the net sales that is being produced out of this uh, of these components uh, of these products and uh, as a baseline we have a um, darker line so this is the regular um, component optimization without any additional purchases this is what we can get without um, asking anyone for help uh, external help and uh, as you can see the uh, pink line which is uh, the Mm, situation after we purchase this component 8 uh, is exactly the same as the benchmark. So buying component 8 alone did not unblock the production, so we basically wasted money. On the other hand, if we buy component 2 and component 4 together, then we can see that this per pink line goes above uh, the baseline, meaning that first of all we were able to produce more uh, products and second of all we got more revenue out of it. And uh, to summarize, if you just go with component 8, you will waste money on, on uh, purchasing these components and you will not get any uh, value out of it. On the other hand, uh, going with uh, buying together component 2 and component 4 uh, is increasing the revenue quite significantly. And uh, this kind of answer we can give to our stakeholders so that they can make wise decisions, or informed decisions at least. Uh, now let's look in a second use case. So here we are benchmarking these strategic factors. Uh, so um, benchmarking whether prioritizing certain customers, uh, how much does it cost basically. And here our situation is a little bit different. So we are missing just one component, but this component uh, is used by two products and these two products are purchased by two different customers. As you can notice, uh, one customer is paying quite a lot of money for the products they, they are purchasing, whereas the other is paying very little. And so now we are using a little bit of uh, modified uh, mm, objective function, um, because what we are doing, we want to maximize the revenue, but on the right-hand side we have uh, revenue of all the customers, multiplied by some um, small factor alpha. So we still want to monitor b them, but we don't care too much about them. And uh, the um, first element of uh, the um, objective function equation is actually just over the customers that we want to prioritize. And so now the stakeholders might be asking, uh, how much does it cost to prioritize customer 16? So this is the one who is paying very little for, for the product they are ordering. And so now let's give them the answer. So first of all, looking at the quantities uh, that we are able to manufacture, uh, these quantities are basically the same which you get by the height of uh, the striped rectangles in a plot. It's only that instead of uh, manufacturing one product, we shift it to another product. And uh, so now we are not uh, producing the product for the customer who is paying a lot. Instead, we are pay uh, producing the product that is ordered by customer 16. When it comes to revenue, the differences are more substantial. So you can basically see that uh, the revenue that we got now from this, this yellow bars uh, this is very low comparing to what we were able to obtain previously from the other customer. 
So in total, the, the, the cost of uh, prioritizing certain customer can be evaluated this way by comparing to the um, benchmark the um, scenario. To and here the benchmark scenario is always this regular revenue uh, maximization that we do without any additional purchases or without any <coughs> any uh, mm, additional prioritizations. Um, and that way we can give the cost that, for example, in this situation, if we wanted to prioritize customer 16, it costs 1.2 million euro. So that was about the algorithm itself. Now the second part that I promised, which is embedding the solution in the cloud. And uh, that's a little bit less mathematical, so if you fell asleep, you can <laughs> now wake up. And uh, why is it important? Well, first of all, the great majority of projects of uh, artificial intelligence models never make it into production. The so 87% or 90% depending on the source, uh, but it's a great majority. And uh, secondly, it is actually critically important that when we develop such a model and it's giving us the answers to some very difficult question, um, then it should be deployed and available to the user so that they can um, make uh, use of it and solve the problems that they are facing. And uh, the modern uh, architecture that, uh, um, or the modern ecosystem or environment in which we are embedding our applications uh, is a cloud. It might be changing, like obviously it is changing. Ten years ago it was in on-premise uh, um, infrastructure, today it is cloud. Uh, tomorrow it might be something completely different, but what is important is that we want to embed the, um, the this model that we built into the um, uh, infrastructure that is currently um, modern, used, and uh, um, will be made use of. And th so the ma major uh, um, major mm, um, major reasons why we use uh, why we move towards cloud is that first of all um, it is uh, mm, due to the decrease of the cost due to scalability uh, due to business continuity uh, or due to collaboration efficiency because everyone can have access to this cloud uh, environment uh, due to flexibility of uh, getting one service switching the other service off and so on and also due to fashion. So there's this ongoing trend of uh, deploying business solutions into the cloud environment. And when we look at the architecture uh, of the so solution that we proposed and what we developed, uh, let's first have a look at the ETL process. Uh, so uh, here we basically have on the right hand side there's this uh, MATLAB uh, um, Azure MATLAB uh, VM, this is the virtual machine on which the um, MATLAB uh, program is um, deployed and the whole optimization uh, engine was written in uh, uh, MATLAB. It is using the mm, optimization solver, uh, this is a commercial one, but the um, uh, problem was defined in MATLAB. So this is like the core of, of, of uh, final architecture. Um, and let us now first uh, focus on this right-hand side, because here clearly we have two, two sides of, of a picture. Firstly, we have this weekly data processing uh, that is mostly uh, concerned with uh, data update. Uh, and on, on the right-hand side, we have a case data processing, which is basically incoming parameters from uh, end users who want some scenarios calculated for them. So here from the architecture perspective, we have a user who access the, um, our application via front end and uh, they put in some parameters like um, what kind of objective they want, uh, whether they want to prioritize certain customers, whether they purchase some uh, components, uh, all these kind of parameters. These parameters are then passed into some web API 
that communicates over the service bus uh, and uh, executes a console application that in turn executes MATLAB, which is a little bit um, executing chain, but nevertheless, this is where the whole parameters are passed to MATLAB and the MATLAB is doing the uh, heavy lifting. <coughs> Now the results are passed back, stored in a database, and that database, and also the data coming from the ETL process, this weekly update, that this is then fed into Power BI, um, that again is displayed to the user. So it's kind of like a loop process, and and uh, every every scenario that is being calculated is actually enriching the whole data that is in the system. Uh, this is from the application point of view, like the backend architecture, and that actually doesn't look um, like rocket science. And s but uh, let now let us now look at this uh, weekly data processing. Here we again don't have very much <laughs> of a rocket science. Actually, there's uh, this rocket science is. Uh, after all, is uh, nowhere. It's uh, mostly about software engineering skills to put and the DevOps skills to put these things all together. Um, but here, within the weekly data processing, uh, we actually wanted to achieve certain things. We wanted to have this whole data processing part done automatically without any need of uh, of uh, human labor. And this is where the challenge came in. So. Uh, this wasn't about the whole architecture of the solution. It was about these elements here and there that were um, mm, detrimental <laughs> to the whole process or were actually obstacles that we needed to uh, overcome. And especially there was one database. I mean, it is noted here as a database, but it's actually a data source. And uh, automating this data source uh, became great challenge to us. And uh, how we overcome it, uh, I'll describe in the automation part. And well, let us jump into it. So the, the challenge itself, uh, it was arising from the fact that um, we were using Windows desktop application to get some data. Uh, this desktop application was a uh, top-notch solution like 10 or 15 years ago when it was purchased. Um, but unfortunately, it isn't in development mode anymore. It is only in the maintenance mode. So if some bugs happen, then somebody will fix them. But otherwise, sorry, no. And uh, the, the unfortunate part of it was that there was no web API to get the data. There was no direct connection to the data warehouse or whatsoever. And the only way to get the data out of the system uh, was by manual clicking and waiting. And for a person to, to do the export of all the reports that we had uh, uh, designed, it was taking one hour. And now imagine we, we would have to do it every week. So one hour of clicking and waiting. So, uh, well, you can think of better, works to better things to do uh, at work. At least I can. Uh, so uh, this was the challenge that we wanted to overcome. And the way we did it was with E2D2. E2D2 is a bot that is doing this, auto, uh, this clicking and waiting for us. And uh, so here's a little bit of our architecture of how that E2D2 looks like and how it worked. And so on the left-hand side, we have a virtual machine. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, additional Azure um, services in the cloud. And so every week, this uh, on this virtual machine, a uh, Python script was the executed, and this Python script was executing or starting the, the desktop application that I just mentioned. Um, because this application, well, it was protecting the mm, the data, so it requires some multi-factor authentication to get to it. And uh, so, first of all, we needed the user and a password. And then we needed some additional information here. Exactly, it was co uh, cache token um, to perform this uh, multi-step uh, authentication. And so uh, this um, data was is kept securely in a in a key vault in Azure um, in Azure Cloud. 
And so once we obtained this data from uh, Key Vault, we were able to log in into the application. And uh, after the login, uh, the application itself was sending some sort of one time password to the email associated to the user that we used. Uh, so using the cache token, we were able to access the email and uh, read this uh, one time password. That allowed us to authenticate. And at this point, actually the reminder of the whole bot uh, was uh, relatively easy because there exist tools to our libraries to click on a desktop application. And uh, so in a, in a loop, we were able to re uh, extract the reports uh, out of this, uh, this application. And finally, once the export was done, uh, the whole bunch of files was uh, copied to FileShare. And um, did it solve the problem? Well, yes. Did it uh, exclude the manual labor? Almost. So uh, if you have multi-factor authentication, then basically you, well, well, probably from a security point of view, you shouldn't be overcoming it fully with a machine. So there need to be still a human in a loop. But then the amount of work that is required to be done uh, is very tiny. It's just authenticating and refreshing the token every now and again. Uh, so why did I talk about it? To just make you aware that, or maybe maybe you are aware of it already, uh, and probably you are, but I wanted to stress the fact that wha when it comes to designing the overall architecture of a solution, from my point of view, it is not that difficult. The difficult parts are these elements that are like obstacles that are preventing us for some reason, like this desktop application, uh, from uh, from automating fully our workload or our workflow. And uh, these challenges are, are kind of fun to, to resolve. And uh, for me, uh, working on E2D2 was definitely a fun. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, co conquering these small challenges uh, is actually making a difference. And to now let's move to the summary. It's time for us to sh uh, slowly finish uh, this presentation. And so let's recap on what I talked about. So, well, the, this presentation was about this uh, uh, artificial intelligence-based solution that uh, works end-to-end -end and is able to provide some insights to, to, the, uh, to the users to mm, allow them to make informed decisions. <coughs> so going from the bottom layer, we have a human, the user, uh, who wants to answer certain question. They can access the application through the um, user interface that passes on the data, um, enriches this data with what we already know about the, the, the world, so to say. Um, this, this data is fed into the optimization algorithm, uh, which in turn is producing some results. These results are presented in a Power BI, I embedded in a, um, in a web application, and that allows the end users to make some insights and make these decisions that they were after. So this is the overview of the application on, on a kind of a use, case scenario, use case level. Uh, but to finalize uh, uh, and final um, conclude uh, the presentation, I think there are two aspects of a successful business solution. So first of all, the solution needs to pinpoint and relieve the pain of stakeholders. And secondly, uh, it needs to be embedded in a modern um, infrastructure so that it can be used by the stakeholders easily. And so when it comes to our application that we developed, well, it's uh, basically fulfilling uh, both these requirements or both these uh, aspects. Uh, so we f uh, addressed the problem that was uh, a pain to, to the stakeholders, to business stakeholders at the company. Uh, we used uh, some um, um, state-of-the-art uh, research methods to solve this problem. 
then uh, we were able to embed the solution into the modern architecture, modern infrastructure, meaning the cloud. And finally, the solution is already used by the stakeholders and is uh, generating uh, mm, financial um, impact. Thank you for, for your listening. Agata, thank you so much. Thank you very much for this uh, analysis. Cheers. This is Code Dive. Don't go away. We'll be back after this break.
Hello, welcome back. This is Code Dive, and our next speaker is Rafał Pasek. Now, Rafał is a product manager here at Nokia with 15 years experience in software development for PC and web. He started as a developer, but then migrated to project and technical management roles. He works with multiple open source big data tools, including Apache Hadoop Platform, Hive, Impala, Spark, Presto SQL, and custom solutions to address various aspects of data flow, orchestration, and data governance. So, Rafa, over to you. Hi, I'm Rafa Pasek and I work at Nokia. Welcome to my presentation about analyzing configuration of cellular networks at Nokia with Apache Hadoop, Apache Spark, and Presto. Let me start with a short introduction. Apache Hadoop and Apache Spark are widely accepted open source solutions for addressing big data problems with massively parallel processing, with the Spark slowly pushing its older brother to the corner. At the same time, Presto is on its way to become a number one SQL on anything query engine. At Nokia, we use them to build a system to analyze configuration of cellular networks. It uses massively parallel processing and big data warehousing to allow running ad hoc analytics on creation and creation of reporting dashboards over the collected data. The system presented here has been created as part of a project titled Design First in the World Telco Network Development Assistant, the analytical tool addressing comprehensive approach to telco network analysis instead of today's segmented approach. To support Nokia, product development by profiling existing network configuration. This project has been supported with the European Union grant under Smart Growth Operational Program for the years 2014-2020. The original Polish title is presented below. This presentation focuses on part of the system that performs the initial processing, which translates high-complexity row-level data into lower-complexity telecommunication domain entities and attributes, and makes the results available for further processing and querying. I will start with describing the problem and follow with showing the approach we took to solve it. Then I will describe the software solutions like Hadoop, Spark, Presto and their application to specific parts of our processing and data warehousing concept. And I will end with a handful of pitfalls and learnings we took from them when designing and operating our system. In the first part, I will describe the characteristics of the problem and say why is it not easy to address it with the popular massively parallel processing solutions. But what is the cellular network configuration data that we need to process? This data describes two aspects. The hardware infrastructure, that is devices, their physical con configuration and interconnections. And those devices are the elements that build the radio part of the network, that is the one responsible for maintaining radio communication with cell phones, and the core part of the network, that is responsible for the backbone of the cellular network. The examples are radio access point cabinet and various system and basement modules located in it. And the second aspect is software and logical configuration, which includes information about software running on physical devices, like a software release and builds, a logical configuration of a network, like network cells with assigned frequency bands and bandwidths, and information about status of switchable features, example, multiple input, multiple output feature, given the slide. It is worth mentioning that it is purely information about the network infrastructure, and no information about subscribers is included whatsoever. Now, what are the characteristics of the network configuration data? Let's start with size. A single configuration management dump file that carries information about a full network cluster is typically of a few gigabytes in size. This must be multiplied by the number of clusters per operator, which is up to 50 and then multiplied by the number of operators, which is a few hundred. The result is a terabyte scale problem when talking about the data describing the current configuration only, 
and even more when historical data are included. Fortunately, the variability of the data and the f therefore the related inflow are all. The data change rather seldom because typically network configurations is not changed, except for when a new network elements is, new network elements are being added, and when some changes are allowed out to the operator's networks, may it be new hardware or software. Obviously, in such a cases, there is also the most interest to observe the changes in a higher temporal resolution. Therefore, the data ingestion rate that is the rate at which new network configuration dump files are being provided, varies from one refresh in three months for operators where there is are little or no changes, up to once per day in cases where the variability is high. Knowing the size and inflow of the input data, let us now dig into the complexity of the data itself. The CM dump files come in an XML format, thus the data are semi-structured. This means that processing them is not a simple number crunching, but we must deal with complex, nested, and mostly non-numerical data. The XML files include over 100 distinct types of elements and over 10,000 distinct attributes in total. To make things even harder, multiple versions of the data model are in use by different products, so similar things are sometimes represented very differently within the XML structure. All that adds to the overall complexity, making it hard to analyze the network configuration using input files as they are. Thus, this complexity needs to be hidden, and this is done by translating this raw data into higher level telecommunication entities and their domain level attributes. We also observe our data to be skewed, that means uneven. The amount of information to process varies significantly, which comes from two levels. First, the input file level, where a cluster size, that is the amount of elements that build a network cluster, varies between a few hundred and tens of thousands. Second, on the network element level itself. For example, the number of cells under a single radio access point varies between one cell and over 500 cells. As will be discussed later, skewing data is problematic for massively parallel processing and must be explicitly handled. Let me now describe the kind of analytics we expect to be run on the network configuration data. I will start with a bunch of example queries and one might, one might to want to answer from the collected data. A few simple ones first. How many radio uh, modules of each variant are in the field? Does this operator use that feature and on how many cells? Which network elements in operator's network are potentially affected by a specific technical issue? What is the most common value of this row attribute for that operator and how does it compare to the global market? How fast are new software versions being rolled out? Some example more complex queries are how many different configurations of some network element type are in the field and which is the most common? Which configurations used by this operator has been tested in our test labs recently? Our system is expected to allow answering these types of questions directly with simple queries and interactive-like performance. But there are also categories of questions, with the two examples on the bottom right, that are not expected to be quickly answered from our results. The examples are which other operators are like this operator? Such a question requires defining and calculating affinity criteria for whole networks. And the second one is how does this feature affect performance? This query, on the other hand, requires calculating correlation between historical configurations and network performance data. Why questions like that cannot be answered based on our results directly? Our results are among inputs for further processing flows that produce answers for such questions. But these latter processing flows are out of scope for today's presentation. Knowing the kind of queries we expect to be run on the data, 
Let us discuss the complexity of data in more details by looking at them from the telecommunication domain perspective. As I have already mentioned, while describing complexity of the raw data, we want to hide it by transforming the data into telco domain level entities and attributes. What do we know about them? First, the number of telecommunication domain attributes is lower than the number of row level attributes, but it is still in a range of thousands. Second, the rules to translate raw data into telco attributes are not constant and must be updated. For example, activation of a specific telco feature depends on values of specific row level attributes, which might be different for different variants of the product, and it might change with the version of the used software. To address that, we need an elastic mechanism that allows our colleagues that are telecommunication experts to define and maintain such translation rules. We call this mechanism all reports. Additional complexity comes with the term configuration, as it is a different thing for different people. Even the most basic understanding, where a configuration describes only the used hardware and interconnections, there might be differences between which hardware elements and which of their attributes should be considered when saying that two network elements have the same configuration or not. Typically, logical network configuration attributes, like the frequency bands and bandwidths used by radio users, are also considered as part of configuration. And it can go even further, for example, by including activation of selected features as part of configuration definition. Overall, the mechanism for defining configuration of a specific network element must be flexible regarding the list of attributes and interconnections. We call the mechanism all configurations. I will describe all reports and all configurations in more details further in this presentation. Some inquiries, some inquiries need values of the row level attributes on top of the telco domain attributes. Thus, we need to provide values of row attributes in a way that is compatible with how we, how we provide telco domain attributes, to allow simple joining of such data when making queries. Additionally, we wanted this mechanism to be fully automatic, to not require creation of over 10,000 manual translation rules. That is the number of row level attributes. We call this mechanism all distributions, and I will not discuss it in detail, but will just share the basic idea behind it, which is to automatically generate virtual OR reports for each of the row attributes. Additionally, while in most cases the interest is in querying the latest configuration data, sometimes it is needed to check the historical results for a specific date or even to check the trends of changes over time. We have opted for separate mechanisms for the daily data versus the trends to allow for better optimization of data processing and warehousing. These two mechanisms are the, and the result sets they produce are called all snapshots and all timelines and will be described later. In the second part, I will describe how we address the specifics of the network configuration data I will briefly describe the syntax and semantics of all reports and show stages of the processing timelines and data warehousing concepts behind all snapshots and all timelines. As explained earlier, we put a telco domain data model over the raw data to reduce the complexity. This data model defines 18 entity types that come from the telco domain. These entity types are put in the relations which correspond to their physical or logical organization. The graph on the bottom right presents such relations for a subset of contexts. We can see a BTS, which stands for base station or base transceiver station to be exact, a logical radio network element and radio cells it provides, and the equipment it uses, a radio access point, that is built from radio system and basement modules, which are physically located in radio access point cabinets. Due to this complex hierarchical structure, we use a graph-based representations of the entities during processing. This allows for easy referencing of the interconnected entities, 
which simplifies creation of reports that must reference attributes of multiple interconnected entities. Let us now discuss the OWL reports language that makes that possible. A single OWL report, or a first-level report, is calculated for a specific telco domain entity, a specific context. That means, for example, that a cell context report for feature activation status will provide information about activations of a specific feature separately for each radio cell entity. Now here is an exemplar report. As you can see, the report defines the context it is calculated for, which is cell in this case. It uses a custom grammar where operator param retrieves values of row level attributes. Another operator, SWL or software release, is used to check if the software version of current element need meets some criteria. And then operator parent is used to reference a parent entity. It is a powerful solution, but requires complex logic for parsing the raw data into results. Thus, the all reports parser is basically an interpreter of all reports written in Scala. On top of first level all reports, a second level reports called all configuration reports are defined. The purpose of, of a configuration report is to define how a configuration of a network element is to be calculated. That is, which telco domain entities and which of their attributes are to be taken, and how they are combined to produce a configuration result. This allows for defining different kinds of configuration views to address different needs. Example 2 configuration types are shown on the picture. Base station topology is a complex one involving 8 contexts, the blue boxes, and 21 attributes in the grey boxes. And the second configuration radio, radio footprint is a much simpler one with just 2 contexts and 11 attributes. The results of such a configuration report is represented with a JSON object whose structure and content are, uh, that are the entities and attributes follow the definition given in the report which also is similar to a JSON object definition. One problem we had to tackle is that both the current network configuration data and the old reports change over time. Despite these changes, we need to keep the results set coherent. That is to avoid having parts of data, like data for a subset of network clusters, translated with different sets of ver or versions of reports. This is to assure that we can always compare the results with each other, without risking that we will be comparing apples and oranges. The solution we opted for is creation of so-called daily snapshots, which are result sets for all latest approved versions of reports, calculated for latest approved data from all network clusters. Such a daily snapshot provides a complete coherent, thus comparable, and fresh information about all network clusters. Additionally, the snapshots are immutable. It does not change since creator, which makes providing data for further processing steps easy. You just need to notify such a system that a new snapshot has been created. Daily snapshots can also be archived to provide historical results for reference, limited by the fact that the reports might be changing over time, so we might not be able to compare current results with a historical one in some cases. On the data management level, a daily snapshot is just a set of tables labeled by a creation timestamp. We also create a virtual current snapshot, which works like a fixed name alias that is updated once per day to point to the newly created snapshot. It is used for ad hoc querying and dashboarding whenever latest data are to be presented. The processing pipeline that produces daily snapshots includes three stages, each subsequent stage using the results of the previous one. Stage 2 and 3 
are responsible for calculating results of all the reports and all configurations respectively. They are executed every time a new snapshot is generated, which is once per day. The first stage that precedes them is executed only once, and when new network configuration dump file arrives. This stage, called row parsing, is responsible for preparing the data to be read by the all reports parser. It translates the raw XML-based input data into an Apache Parquet-based representation. I will describe this Parquet format in more details later during this presentation. This simple conversion allows for reduction of storage space and higher performance than when using XML files directly. In order to answer questions like how fast is this feature adopted by operators, it is useful to visualize aggregated data as trend charts. It is not easy to be done using the daily snapshots, which are separate tables, and the fact that reports are changing over time does not help either. The solution is to prepare a separate optimized dataset that we call all timelines. It is being updated daily for a narrow set of all reports, always using their latest approved versions, so that all historical results use the same versions of reports. The timeline results are stored in two tables. The first table holds results for timeline reports separately for each input file. And the second table specifies which input file was active for a specific network cluster on a specific day. With these two tables, trend plots can be obtained by performing a simple join between them, a simplified SQL code for that is presented here. Please notice that the join between the two tables is done using the file ID. With such an organization of results, even though a single input file might, might apply to multiple historical dates, we are not calculating and keeping copies of results for each of these days but just a single set of results for each file. This is especially important for network clusters where we rarely receive new network configuration dumps, like once in three months. All timelines are calculated in a separate processing pipeline, which also have three stages. It uses the same output of the raw parsing stage as the old snapshot pipeline. In the second stage, the daily refresh of all timelines is started with identification of missing results for all reports. There are three sources for missing results. That are new network configuration dumps files coming in, new timeline enabled all reports being created, or existing timeline enabled reports being modified. The identified missing results are calculated within this stage. In the third stage, Two types of timeline templates mentioned before are being updated with the new results. In the third part, I will focus on software components that we use and their applications to specific parts of our processing and data warehousing solution. I will start with components responsible for the distributed processing of data. In the early phase of our project, we have decided to use Cloudera's CDH as our data processing platform. This open source distribution provides the core Apache Hadoop elements, like the distributed fault tolerant Hadoop file system, HDFS, the Hadoop MapReduce distributed processing, and resource management by IR. Additionally, it includes several other Apache big data projects like Hive. HBase, Spark at Impala, plus a few other ones. With Caldera CDH, we get all these open source projects integrated within a single platform, which greatly simplifies maintenance of a cluster, both deployment and operation. It is worth noting that Caldera provides both a, a paid enterprise edition and a free community edition, though the latter has been recently dropped so version 6 is the last one available with a free license. We have chosen CDH as it allowed us to play with several of those different big data processing and warehousing solutions. I will now describe the ones 
we used starting with those related to data processing. Hadoop MapReduce is a massively parallel processing framework popularized by Jeffrey Dean and Sanjay Gemawat of Google in 2004. It greatly simplifies distributed processing, as all a programmer must provide is an implementation of two functions, map and reduce. And the framework takes care about all the parallel in execution, communication and fault tolerance, and can do that for thousands of nodes. In MapReduce, processing is done in three steps. First, each worker node applies a map function to the local data and writes the output to a temporary storage. Then, in the shuffle step, worker nodes redistribute the data based on the keys produced by the map function, so that all data with the same key are sent to a single worker node. And lastly, in the reduce step, worker nodes process each group of shuffled data to produce an output. Hadoop MapReduce is supported in various languages including C++, Java and Python, but also C, Ruby or Perl. While it allows for performing distributed processing, its performance and scalability is often hindered by the amount of data produced by each step, predominantly the map step, as that data must be written back to disk or sent to other nodes. As a result, the communication cost often dominates the computation cost. Implementing non-trivial processing algorithms using MapReduce paradigm might require several MapReduce my shuffle reduce cycles thus increasing the overall cost as results must be written back, back to disk by the previous map reduce cycle and then read again at the beginning of the next one. Map reduce jobs also have high, high latency, thus they cannot be applied to tasks where, where fast response is required like near real-time processing or interactive analytics. It is though still a good economical solution for linear processing of huge data sets when results are not expected immediately. And we are using MapReduce in our raw parsing stage. Apache Spark is the second component used by us for data processing. It is a general purpose distributed cluster computing framework that is told to be up to 100 times faster than MapReduce. The difference comes predominantly from Spark's in-memory computation. Spark's execution is grouped into stages, with shuffle operations happening of, the, of their boundaries. There can be any number of stages and the operations can form an arbitrary direct acyclic graph. In contrast to MapReduce, Spark can perform multiple transformation operations in memory without going through the write and then read cycles. But to best consume this gain, the data should fit into the available RAM. Spark also uses lazy evaluation. That means the actual execution of transformations will not start until some action operation is triggered. An exemplary action operation is writing the results to disk. As for the recommended applications, Spark is good for fast real-time processing where data feeds the available RAM especially when data must go through multiple processing stages. We use Spark for calculations of our first and second level O reports when producing new snapshots and refreshing timelines. Spark's native language is Scala and it is the one that we use, but one can also use Java, Python and R. Historically, Spark provided three sets of APIs to manipulate the data. These are RDDs, data frames, and data sets. The latter two are now unified. The first API is RDD, or Resilient Distributed Dataset, which is just an immutable distributed collection of data elements partitioned across nodes. It provides a low-level API where data is manipulated with functional programming constructs. As it is just a collection of any JVM objects, it can handle any type of data, including unstructured and semi-structured data. Data frames and data sets were provided later. They use RDDs underneath, but organize the data into named columns and thus impose a table-like structure. 
they provide higher level abstractions, memory and performance optimizations that are not available for RDDs. Although data frames and data set can handle semi-structured data, we have opted for RDDs as we represent our data as gaps with annotated nodes. Thus, with RDDs, we gain flexibility in how we can work with our data. Just to provide an example of how using RDDs looks in Scala code, here is a function from our project. As can be seen, it takes an RDD of data rows as an input and returns results as another RDD. The actual processing is defined by the flat map function, which is one of Spark's transformation operations. That is an operation which transforms one RDD into another RDD. And then, reduce by key is used to join results with the same value of E and partition by is used to partition the data again using a different key. While we predominantly work with RDDs, we switch to data frames to use the higher level API and optimizations when performing simple transformations that do not require graph representation of data, and when writing results which are just tables nevertheless. Another Apache component we use, which is delivered with Cloudera CDH, is Hive. It is important to say that Hive is actually two things. First, it is a data warehousing solution that provides data management layer which targets OLAP, that is online analytical processing workloads. We use this part of Hive to make our input and output data organized and made available as tables. I will describe that in more details later. Second, Hive is a distributed query engine that utilizes a language similar to SQL. In CDH, Hive utilizes either MapReduce or Spark to run its queries. It is good for batch processing of tabular data, especially when transformations can be written easily within, with its SQL-like language. That is why we are using Hive queries to produce simple aggregations and summaries of data. The common components described previously were part of our processing pipeline, and now I will describe components used for querying the produced data. Impala is a distributed SQL query engine that excels in low latency interactive analytics. It is advertised to provide the fastest time to insight among such systems. Unfortunately, Impala's SQL dialect is not NZ compliant, and it does not allow working with complex data types directly. Though values stored in array of map type or map type columns can still be referenced using Impala's specific syntax of nested tables. Impala is good for interactive ad hoc querying over data registered in Hive Metastore. But in our solution, we are mostly using Impala's JDBC interface to provide other data processing systems with access to our data. It allows those systems to offload some computation by simply issuing a SQL query that will be executed on our cluster using its resources. Presto is another tool used by us to query the resulting data, and the only one here that does not come with Cloudera or Apache. Similarly to Impala, Presto is a distributed SQL engine built primarily for low la latency analytics. In contrast to Impala, Presto supports much wider set of data source types, including classical SQL databases and a variety of NoSQL ones, like Cassandra, MongoDB, Elasticsearch and BigQuery, just to name a few big ones. It also supports querying data from files stored on HDFS and S3, and new data sources, source types can be added by providing an implementation of a connector interface. It is available as a free open source system, but there are also paid commercial distributions which come with a professional support. Presto has also been used by Amazon to build their serverless interactive query service called Athena that allows running SQL queries over data which resides as files on S3. At Nokia, we are using Presto for two use cases. That is, our internal business intelligence software, 
where it is used for ad hoc querying as well as creating complex reporting dashboards. And for a simple ETL data pump solution that reads the data out of our system, transforms it using SQL and stores in an external system. In both cases, we are using Presto just to query and transform the data. Presto also supports writing the data back to HDFS and S3, but we have so far not put that into use. Now, how does Presto compare to Impala in our experience? What we like about Presto is its Enzyme compliance, which makes it easier to integrate with other tools, for example, business intelligence software. It is also easier to learn from someone who is familiar with SQL already. We are also using Presto support for various data sources. The possibility to query different types of databases as a single meta database allows us to simply join data coming from a variety of database systems used at Nokia. Another big advantage for Presto is the power of its query language. First, in contrast to Impala, Presto allows working directly with complex data types like structs, arrays, and maps. Second, Presto provides powerful features like lambda expressions that can be used, for example, to operate on arrays and maps. An example of a stab query at the bottom uses a generic transform operation with, with operands given as lambda expressions to transform an array of strings, which is in this example a list of bandwidth, ex bandwidth descriptions like 15 MHz, 20 MHz, and so on, into a single string showing number of occurrences of each bandwidth. A big advantage of such constructs is that they can be used in line, which simplifies the SQL code. Thus, we use statements like that in, on our reporting dashboards, for example, when combining complex results into human readable strings. As a remark, for those willing to give Presto a try, there are currently two active open source projects. That is the original PrestoDB.io, maintained by Facebook, and one that is maintained by the Presto Software Foundation called Presto SQL.io. Let us now discuss our data warehousing solution in more details. I will start by describing the file format we use to store our data. This format is Apache Parquet, and we use it to store all intermediary and final outputs on HDFS. It is a column-oriented format, which means that data are not serialized row by row, like for example in the popular CSV format and most databases, but rather column by column. In fact, a mixed approach is used for Parquet, which is shown on the picture on the right. First, the file is divided into so-called row groups, which are just groups of rows. Then, each row, row, each row group is written column by column, with column data additionally divided into pages. Then, additional metadata for row groups and columns are written in the footer, to allow for quick access to specific row groups and columns. There are two main advantages of such a format. That is efficient storage, which comes thanks to encoding and compression being done on individual columns, where the values are more similar to each other than within rows. It also allows for more efficient reading, as in analytic, ca analytic cases, one typically queries only a subset of columns, and that's thanks to column-oriented storage, only those columns must be fetched from disk. It was important for us that Parquet provides support for complex types because results of all first-level reports are maps. We have chosen it over other the other popular column-oriented format ORC, ORC, as Parquet is cloud era native. What I mean by that is that elements of CDH like Impala can work with Parquet out of the box. I have said previously that all our data which are Apache Parquet use Apache Parquet format underneath, and they are organized into tables. This is possible thanks to the already mentioned Hive Metastore and an H catalog service that is built on top of it. It not only allows to see the data that resides on, as files on HDFS as relational tables, 
but also allows for further optimizations, thanks to dividing the data with table partitioning and bucketing. Partitioning allows to divide the data in, into a multi-level hierarchy of partitions that are reflected on a file system as a folder tree. The top-level folder represents a single table. In our case, the first level of subfolders partition the data per operator and the second level of folders partition is it further per network cluster. The actual parquet data files, not shown on the picture, are placed in the bottom level leaf folders. As you can notice, the folder names follow a simple template. They start with the name of a virtual partitioning column, that is operator ID and cluster ID in our case, followed by an equality sign and a specific value that is either a string or an integer. Such a simple partitioning mechanism allows for effective filtering of data to be read. For example, when a query includes a where operator ID equals 2 predicate, it is only necessary to read data from files that reside in matching partitions. This is supported by all query engines that work with Hive Metastore, be it Hive, Impala or Presto. Then we have bucketing which works on the level of a single partition or a whole unpartitioned table. In bucketing, data to be written are divided into a configurable number of buckets, each stored as a separate file. The decision to which bucket a specific row is written is based on a hash function over a value of selected column. Thus, when looking for data with a specific value of the bucketed column, it is easy to identify which file must be read. The mechanism is also used when performing table joins, assuming that the tables being joined are using compatible bucketing schemes. Within our system, we are using table partitioning by operator and cluster ID in all our snapshot tables, and by file ID in timeline tables. We have not yet applied bucketing to any of our tables due to a reason that I will describe later. I will now go more into the actual structure of our snapshot tables. The complexity of a, of a query and its performance strongly depends on the structure of the query data. And different types of queries might require different data structures to be optimal. One of the possible solutions used in the OLAP world is to have redundant representation of data. In our case, we have decided to provide snapshot tables in two variants that we call white table and tall table. In the white table representation, each row represents a single element identified with its, with its ID. And there are separate columns to hold results for each of the all first level reports. There are then even hundreds of such columns in a table. In the tall table representation, on the other hand, a single row corresponds to a unique, unique result of a single report, identified with columns defining the report ID and the distinct result. Additionally, there are two columns. One holds a count of elements with the specific result, and the second one an array of the IDs. Please notice that the first two columns, operator ID and cluster ID, are in fact virtual partitioning columns represented with folders rather than actual data columns in parquet files. These white and tall table representations allow us to provide a simple and efficient SQL query for vast variety of inquiries, but by the price of practically doubling the storage requirements. Let me give some examples for using these representations. The white table representation is optimized for easily combining of results of different reports. The exemplary query on the right retrieves numbers of occurrences of two results of, of distinct results for two feature activation status reports combined with each other. This means the results provide information on, on how many elements has a specific value for feature A while having a specific value for feature B. And additionally, here this is done only for elements filtered by a value of a third feature activation status report. Example res re results for this query are visualized with a heat map chart at the bottom right, with results of feature A on one axis, 
results of feature B on the other axis, and total number of elements on the respective intersections. It is worth mentioning that thanks to using a column-oriented storage, even though the rows in the white tables are very long, we are effectively reading only a small subset of data from disks, as only values of the referenced columns are being fetched. On the other hand, the tall table representation is optimized for listing results of multiple reports individually, that is not combined with each other, especially if we do not know the specific list of reports up front, but we for example know only a category they belong to. This is because neither Preston nor Impala support dynamic SQL that would allow us to select the required columns from the white snapshot dynamically. The presented query uses tall snapshot table to calculate numbers of occurrences of specific results for the first 10 feature activation status reports. Here, selected with an inline subquery from reports metadata table. Again, we can plot the result as a heat map, but this time with the 10 reports on one axis, the unique results on the other, and the total number of occurrences on the respective intersections. Please notice that this time the results are presented separately for each of the 10 feature activation status reports and not combined as in the previous example. I would like to end this presentation with a handful of problems we run into while developing our system, hoping that one can learn from them and avoid making the same mistakes we did. I will start with our Apache HBase story. Apache HBase is a distributed scalable big data storage that is based on Hadoop. It is advertised as being suitable for billions of rows and millions of columns with efficient record lookup on key, thanks to being internally represented as a key value map. It is also being said to be optimized for write heavy loads and it allows for data mutation. At first, we tried to use HBase for our intermediate raw data storage so that it would be used by the all parser, but it failed for us due to the following reasons. First, our load is not write heavy. After the data are written at the raw parsing stage, they are no longer modified but are just being read by the all parser multiple times. Second, all reports parser is not performing record lookups on key but instead it needs to read multiple rows and multiple columns at once to perform its job efficiently. Such full scan operations are unfortunately inefficient in HBase. They are an order of magnitude slower than Parquet. It is also worth mentioning that HBase is not a column-oriented database, but a white column database. Actually, there is a notion of so-called column families in HBase, which allow for having groups and col of columns being written and read separately. Thus, one might say that HBase is column family oriented. But then HBase's documentation states that it does not do well with anything above two or three column families, which is way too small for our case. Bottom line is that you must choose the right tool for your job. Thus, we have moved to Parquet as our storage format. The second pitfall is related to impact of skew or inequality of data and processing. To recall, the skew in our case comes from varying number of, num of network elements in cluster, which directly impacts the size of the input files, but also varying size of network elements themselves, and varying complexity of all reports. Due to skew, a single Spark task, which is the lowest distribution level of work done by Spark, can greatly vary in execution duration. Here you can see exemplary summary metrics for a single Spark stage taken from Spark's web console. Please notice that median task duration is 15 seconds, while maximum duration is 3.5 minutes, which is 14 times larger. A big difference in duration affects the total time considerably. This is because a Spark stage waits until the last task is finished and only afterwards the assigned CPUs and RAM can be reused for another stage. How to handle a SPU in Spark then? 
the general hint is to not be afraid of the shuffle. When reading about Spark or simply any massive parallel processing system, you will often find information that shuffle should be avoided, as it impacts performance. Well, that's right, but actually, for many cases, including handling of skew, shuffle is the only solution. Notice that the median and maximum input size differs by a ratio close to the one we see for duration. So the skew in the input size is the source of the observed skew in duration, and an additional shuffle can be of help here. In Spark, you can explicitly repartition data at any time according to your definition of key, which should consider the size and complexity of the resulting task to do its job best. Thanks to such an approach, we have been able to reduce the observed skew in task duration considerably, which allowed us to get total execution time for snapshot down, down by almost a half. When working with different components of CDH, you might also hint interoperability problems. For example, both Hive and Spark support bucketing, but they do it differently. One is optimized for reds, why the other for writes? The unfortunate result is that bucketed tables written by Spark cannot be read by Hive and Presto, as the latter uses Hive-compatible bucketing scheme. Another example is Impala versus Hive. Impala has its own meta store where it keeps information about tables, partitions, and their metadata. The meta store should be in sync with Hive's one, but we have observed race conditions. For example, when executing a sequence of DDL or data definition language statements in Impala to drop and then recreate a table. After a successful drop table statement, the subsequent create table statement was failing due to the table still existing in Hive Metastore. It is also hard to keep Hive and Impala in sync when content on tables are changing. This is due to the fact that Impala does not support Hive's table and partition logs, but provides its own implementation that is incompatible with that. One can also run into problems due to high number of columns in a table. Some of our snapshot tables have over 1,000 columns, and we have noticed problems specifically with Spark and Presto. For example, we are we were not able to use Spark SQL to create such what tables, as we ended up with errors due to the generated statement exceeding some limit. Also, within Spark we had problems when writing the results back to Parquet, as having that many columns increases the memory pressure and might produce out-of-memory errors. And then in Presto, why tables cause an increase of query planning time for select queries? The additional few seconds might sound small, but it is often unacceptable for interactive queries. We have been able to solve the problem by enabling caching of Hive Metastore data in Presto. Though this caching mechanism required fine-tuning as the default configuration created high pressure on the Hive Metastore up to the point where it was rendered unavailable for minutes. We have also observed problems related to having tables with high number of partitions, as some of our tables have tens or even hundreds of thousand partitions. For such tables, simple Impala DDL statements for deleting an existing partition takes considerable am amount of time, even tens of seconds. One must be especially careful when making DDL statements that affect multiple partitions, as they take a proportional time. This is important as due to Impala's imperfect clocking, such lengthy DDL statements can block other DDL statements for unrelated tables. You can also hit errors with Hive and Spark while making even simple queries that must specify many partitions explicitly. Like the query at the bottom that just computes the total number of rows over a subset of partitions. When the where source in close contain more than 1,906 partitions, the query fails with an error message that points to a low-level thrift transport exception. 
Such low-level or cryptic error messages are unfortunately quite common when working with Hive and Spark. Therefore, debugging is often cumbersome and sometimes the only thing left to do is to inspect the source code of those open source projects. The last problem I would like to talk about is an out of memory during Spark execution. Obviously, it happens if a Spark executor tries to allocate more memory than is available, which can be a sign that the executor was given with too big work to be done. The problem manifests in logs as a generic Spark execution lost message, and in our experience it is often indeterministic. What I mean is that for a specific input, the problem sometimes appears and sometimes not. Fine-tuning of a memory consumption in Spark is a cumbersome task with multiple cross-related configuration parameters. One pitfall to avoid is to be careful when adjusting the RAM to CPU ratio of a Spark executor. Adjusting it can help to alleviate the problem by providing additional memory for the same amount of computation to be done. But having the ratio of Spark executor different than the ratio of the overall cluster leads to underutilization of resources. In this case, ordering more RAM for Spark executors can cause CPUs to be underutilized. This effect is shown with the two charts at the bottom. The gray box is the amount of CPUs, that is the vertical dimension, and RAM, the horizontal dimension, available for Spark. In case Spark executors have the same ratio, we can maximize the resource usage as we can have enough Spark executors to utilize all available RAM and CPUs. But if we decide to change the ratio, for example increase the amount of RAM per CPU by one third, like in the example on the right, we end up with unused CPUs as we are not able to create as many executors as required due to RAM being, being exhausted first. Therefore, one has to be careful when playing with this ratio. To summarize our experience so far, working with Hive, Spark, Impala and Presto is not all roses. But then again it works, and we are able to generate our daily snapshots, refresh the timelines and provide all those results for ad hoc querying, dashboarding and processing by further flows. I'm Rafał Pasek from Nokia and thanks for joining me. Rafał, great. Thanks very much. Thank you for your insight and wonderful presentation. So this is it for this year's Code Dive. I'd like to thank the speakers. I'd like to thank our partners, and I'd like to thank our organizers here at Nokia. So Adam Badura, Marcin Wolniak, thank you very much for making it happen. Special thanks goes to Event Stream Company. Thank you very much for recording us. The crew here have been working around the clock. And of course, and most of all, I'd like to thank you, the audience, our participants. It was great of you to join. And I think, yes, this is it. It was number seven when it comes to Code Dive, and it was the first time we've done it exclusively online. And I'm not sure if I can, but I will share a rumor that uh, the word on the street is we will be meeting again next year for Code Dive, so do join us again. Other than that, my name is Rafał Motriuk. I'm a science and technology journalist. Thank you very much for having me, and 